Just a reminder to everyone attending, this meeting is being recorded. I'll take a, a roll call before I get started. Commissioner Cameron? Uh, good morning, I'm here. Good morning, Commissioner O'Brien. Good morning, I'm here. Thank you, and Commissioner Zuniga. I'm here, good morning, everyone. Great, thank you. A reminder to folks who are attending that we are able to use our virtual platform because Governor Baker issued an executive order back in March of 2019 that gives some uh, relief to public bodies like ours from the open meeting law. And we've been able to take advantage of this remote platform since now on March 14th of 2020. Um, <clears throat> gonna get started on a busy day, February 11th. It's now 10.02. It is public meeting number, hard to believe, 335. Um, <clears throat> we'll get started with the approval of minutes. And Commissioner Cameron, I'm, I know I see your smile because it's probably hard for you to believe that you're at that number. And I suspect- That's exactly right, almost a year's worth of meeting every day, wow. I know, I, isn't that true? And-, and uh, smiling as well. Yeah, exactly. All right, we'll get started with the minutes. Commissioner O'Brien, please. October 8th, I think, is your first set. Uh, yep. Uh, Madam Chair, I would move the commission approve the meeting minutes from October 8th, 2020, subject to any correction for typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. Thank you, Commissioner. Any um, edits or corrections you'd like to make? I see everyone's had a chance to review. Okay, we'll go ahead with the vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. And I vote yes. Vivian, four zero. And thank you, Vivian, for your assistance today. Moving thank on to the Madam next. Chair. Yep, the next set, uh, I would move the commission approve the meeting minutes from October 22nd, 2020. Again, subject to correction for any typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Second. Thank you. Any edits on these? Questions? Okay. Commissioner, thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zunica? Aye. And I vote yes, four zero. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien, all set? Okay. And moving on to item number three, Executive Director Wells. Why do I not see her right now? Um, let me just see. Oh. Okay. I'm wondering, I know that she is at the office today. I'm wondering if she's having a, just a tech issue. Let me just see. Sorry. She had a board meeting at some point. I'm not sure when that was. I, I don't think that's today. I okay. think she anticipates being with us. Okay. Um, I just am wondering if she's just having a little bit of a tech issue joining us. Um, I can try to reach out to her. Her, her, her board yeah, meeting was yet. Oh, there she is. I'm here. There I'm just she trying to is. Move my screen around a little bit. I got distracted reading something. <laughs> Great. Do you want to, um, Karen, do you want to uh, put your video on? Yeah, I'm just trying. Uh, hold on. It's working. There I'm we go. Looking wrong, Look at, I'm looking in the wrong direction here. I just got to move my screen. There. Thank you. Um, and uh, you can all see that Karen is in the office safely working today from the luxury of a, um, a full-blown office desk. So thank you. You want to get started with the um, uh, item number 3A. Karen, please. So uh, as a preliminary matter, getting into the, um, before we get into the specific agenda items for uh, the administrative update, I did want to note for you that upon the recommendation of our licensing chief, uh, Lakeisha Skinner, and consistent with the authority that was granted to uh, the executive director back in January of 2019 to approve uh, administrative or ministerial uh, changes to exempt positions. I wanted to let you know I have approved two additional positions for Encore Boston Harbor as exempt from the registration requirement. Uh, Encore requests an exemption for their re resort support ambassador position. 
It's a new position. However, it is identical to the security ambassador position the commission exempted on November 5th, 2020. Uh, the position is responsible for welcoming guests, distributing PPE, and taking thermal temperature scans. Uh, that change uh, changes that instead of reporting to security, they will report to front desk services. Uh, so in fact, Ancor intends to transition the existing security ambassador position over to resort support ambassador. So given those circumstances, I did approve that um, a position as exempt. Similarly, uh, Encore is seeking an exemption for their uniform control supervisor position. Uh, that's also a new position, but its job responsibilities are identical to the uniform control assistant manager position exempted by the commission in January of 2019. Uh, it supervises day-to-day -day uniform operations, including quality monitoring, fittings, and stock. And Encore intends to eliminate the assistant manager role in favor of the supervisor position. So given that these were uh, technical and administrative changes, I went ahead and did that. Uh, if the commission has any concerns or uh, wants to address that further, I'm certainly open to that, but that seemed consistent with the, with the commission's position. Um, and I see Nakisha is available too. Yes, so she's here. Uh, and as a reminder, each of these positions has no connection to the gaming floor, other secure areas, and no access to confidential or sensitive information. And that will continue to be the case under the supervised title. Any, any questions, any questions? Commissioner? Your question sounds uh, completely appropriate to me, those decisions. Okay. Thank okay. you, Karen. Uh, so for the next item under the administrative update, as we have been doing in the past, I'm going to turn it over to Director Milios and Assistant Director Van from the IEP uh, to go over the on-site casino updates, what's been going on at the uh, properties, uh, particularly given the COVID situation that we have going on right now. So I'll turn it over to Loretta first. Thanks, Karen. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Mm -hmm. uh, since, since your last public meeting on January 28th, the, the, the big piece is that the 25% capacity limit has expired. And for us, this means that technically we are able to return to the formula that the commission adopted back in June for determining maximum reduced capacity at, at each casino. Remember the formula was based in part on the number of gaming positions and takes into account the number of employees on site and the allowable number in the casino's amenity businesses. So back in June and, and for reopening in July, the calculation under the formula put each of the properties in the 40% range of building capacity. Uh, uh, of building capacity. Uh, it, actually, the number put Encore in the high 40% range, but Encore uh, agreed to self-impose a maximum number that brought it in line with the other two at, at 40%. So now with the expiration of the 25% cap, we've worked with each of the three properties to update their respective numbers, taking into account uh, the addition of gaming positions that they've gradually added since reopening in, in July. So what we've ended up with are some outdated, uh, updated uh, numbers, uh, strictly going by the formula. Some of those numbers exceed the 40% capacity. So for each of them, they have agreed to utilize the 40% capacity uh, limit that is in keeping with the governor's recent order for other businesses. So they will be monitoring uh, to the 40% number, and we will be monitoring to that number uh, as well. So this is a long-winded way of saying they're basically returning to their reopening uh, numbers, which were uh, uh, 40%. Uh, um, uh, all of the other COVID measures uh, remain in full force. The masking requirement, distancing requirements, the heightened standardization, the signage, the prohibition on eating on the casino floor, the restrictions on beverages, the plexiglass throughout the properties, and the uh, limits to the, ta uh, excuse me, table game seating capacity. Uh, for practical purposes, I wanted to mention that over recent weeks, as you know, they've been capped at the 25%, and none of them in those weeks uh, were in any indication of exceeding the 25% uh, number. 
this does mean though that they will be able to bring folks and have brought folks back from furlough. It's meant the reopening of the hotel at Encore and the anticipated reopening of the MGM hotel on a limited basis uh, next month. Um, so essentially that is the update around the capacity numbers. I'm happy to uh, try to answer any uh, more specific questions. And of course, Mr. Band is here as well. Um, Commissioner Seneca. Yeah, thank you, maybe I just, uh, I just unmuted myself first, uh, Commissioner okay. O'Brien. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe you were gonna get into this, Loretta, but um, there was also the 9.30 uh, curfew um, restriction, I guess, since we last met, I believe, that was lifted by the governor's orders. Will you be um, giving an update on that? or that, that was actually previously lifted, so they have been authorized to return to the 24-7 uh, number, and they have been doing that. Okay. And, and, and I, I thought we reported on that was two weeks you know ago. What? That's right. As, right. As, we did. as you, as we you did. mentioned, but, you refreshed my memory. You're right. Yeah. Um, and you know what? It's fair what we're trying to remember, Commissioner Zuniga. So I just want to remind, given that memory, it, it's hard to keep it all on track. With that came for Encore the um, reopening of the hotel, correct, Loretta? That's right. So that happened a couple weeks ago. Uh, you're exactly right with the return to the 24 7. And Commissioner Zuniga, with that came, if I remember correctly, it was reported a good number of, of um, employees brought back from furlough. Yes, yes, correct. that's that's correct. And um, thank you for that. Okay, good. Other questions and, and reminders for us because it is hard uh, to keep all of the timeline straight. Any other questions? Or I, I do, yeah. Loretta, can you um, just go back? My memory is that even prior to the uh, curfew and the limitation of 25% that none of the licensees were really consistently approaching that 40%. Um, is that correct? That's exactly right. In fact, they were, you know, um, under the 25%. It, it's not as if they were over 25% and then went back to under 25%. That even holds up to today. Nobody's gone over the 25 percent. The 25. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you, Bruce. And, and and we'll be monitoring those numbers closely, Commissioner O'Brien. Um, I think right. Um, yes. Um, because with as the numbers grow, and particularly as if the health trends go continue to go in the right direction, and we know that there's a lot of variables in in that trend. Um, you know, additional resources, et cetera, may be needed. So but I, I think uh, to that point, Karen, it will be important for Loretta and Bruce to continue to keep us apprised on a regular cadence every two weeks, right? I think so too. Commissioner Zunica, did you want to comment? Yeah, yeah. Um, so is it fair to say that now with the 24 hour in operation now for a few weeks and this uh, history that you have of um, observing uh, you know the 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 crowds hovering around 25 percent or or thereabouts. Uh, is it fair to say that now there's um, less risk of those congregations at certain critical times, especially you know when they were closing uh, at 9:30 before? Have you observed any kind of variations, you know, in that occupancy or exiting or congregating? accessing the casino or exiting. Bruce, do you want to, to do that one? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be the, you know, the, the problem that we were having at the around the nine, nine thirty hours before. Uh, that's been eliminated pretty much. Uh, only, only time that uh, we've come close to that is when they have a, a card giveaway or something like that. And they've actually kind of worked out how to do that by placing monitors around the casino floor that uh, you know, kind of shows the same thing, so you don't have to congregate in one area where the giveaway is. So right. they've kind of worked way around that. And is it, is it fair to say that those giveaways are like they were before the pandemic, um, meant to bring in people at times that that it's usually less crowded? You know, they don't they don't give they don't do those giveaways necessarily on weekends, for example. Correct. 
and, and Loretta, maybe this is a good time to, to um, update us on the status of uh, gatherings, the, the governor's uh, requirements around inside and outside gatherings. It's still at 10 and 25. It's, that it's 25 that's right. It's that's still uh, 10 and 25. So I don't think that was adjusted upwards with the recent uh, 40% with the recent lifting of the 25% cap. And then the hotel requirements stay the same too, correct? Correct. So really, it's just a restoration of where we were right um, before the, the most recent restrictions. It is. Yeah. Any further questions, comments? Commissioner Cameron, anything you're concerned about? No, thank you for the report, but uh, I, I don't have any additional questions. Okay, excellent. All right, then moving on, um, Karen, you. to your to Human Resources Division. Yeah, so similar to what we had been doing in the past with the um, before the pandemic, we'd started a practice of at the administrative update having some of the divisions uh, come before the commission, just give a briefing on some of the things that are going on. Uh, so we we restarted that last uh, at the last meeting with the uh, Information and Technology Services Division. So right now, because we've got some good things going on with our HR department, Tripti is going to give you a little bit of an update of some of the things that are going on internally at the office, just to give you a flavor of some of the work that's been doing by that division. So I'll turn that over to Tripti. Hi there. Hi. Good morning, um, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, I would like to provide you an update on uh, some of the human resources initiatives uh, during the last 10 months of remote operations. The efforts focus on the area of virtual culture, performance, um, professional development, and diversity. Uh, the HR team includes Natasha Martin and Jack Nip Jacqueline Connect. Uh, some of our HR efforts uh, we are working to build on and uh, strengthen at the MGC or our virtual community and um, as well as some of the following items that I'd want to share with you in that area. We had conducted an employee survey um, to have a better understanding where um, staff is and how we can support them. Uh, one of the things that came out of it, um, the survey was uh, social distractions, uh, periodic emails, uh, sharing information about various topics intended to create a conversation and build community among staff. Uh, we also have HR office hours and focus group to create a virtual water cooler uh, type of an environment where HR is holding weekly office hours uh, open to all staff as well as smaller group meetings to discuss some targeted topics. We currently have focus groups meeting to discuss social activities, hobbies, uh, apartment dwellers, and um, working environment. Um, also working closely with uh, the executive director on frequent town hall meetings and uh, updating staff uh, regularly uh, because we're remote and getting an opportunity to bring everyone together. Um, we're also ensuring employee safety. We have developed some um, detailed COVID guidelines in line with the CDC and the DPH um, and safety measures for the MGC, MGC staff on site. And, uh, you know, continuing to monitor that uh, to see if there are any shifts or changes that need to uh, be made to offer continued support. Um, looking at what return to the office may look like following the guidance from the governor's directive. Um, as we, as an agency, are in phase four, we do have some folks um, on site, but um, what that may look like. Uh, in the area of professional development and training, um, we have offered some diversity training. Uh, we had a speaker who joined our town hall recently. Um, we also have launched a supervisor training program, a monthly topic on online training followed by small group meetings. And um, as far as uh, development piece, we're also working on the employee handbook, revisiting our policies and guidelines uh, to ensure um, 
stay current and continue to support our staff. Um, we're also doing some work within diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, as you know, uh, we have a small uh, diversity and um, equity inclusion group, a uh, small subgroup, uh, where we are developing some ideas in the area of culture. Um, so we're working in that area to you know, bring some programming to the staff, which includes um, some newsletters, um, further developing our intranet and um, some cultural activities. Um, we're working to improve and streamline our, some of our job descriptions and working closely with Jill on diversity outreach for recruiting, um, as well as continuing to do some recruiting work uh, for the Chief uh, Enforcement Council. Um, we're looking at a couple of positions within IT and um, getting ready to kick off our um, 2021 racing season. So we'll start that soon. And uh, this season typically starts late March, early April with pre-qualifiers. So um, that is some of the stuff that we have um, happening in human resources these days. It's excellent. Questions for Chupti. Uh, a lot going on and evidence that as we've all noted, all, all four of us, how this team continues to fulfill not only all the, the regular obligations of, our, of um, the Gaming Commission, but also addressing the overlay of, of COVID-19 responsibilities. Questions and comments? Quick question, Madam Chair. Um, sure. Tripti, thank you. All those um, programs, um, you, you know, you, you covered a gamut and they all seem very worthwhile. And um, I was interested, Some a couple of them I was not aware of. So I'm really happy to hear about that. Uh, but overall, how would you assess, it, it appears to me by the number of our folks that come into our public meetings or attend the town halls, that folks uh, remain engaged and, um, you know, healthy. Uh, but, but how would you assess overall um, you know, are there any challenges we should be aware of or are things running as smoothly as they can be from, from my perspective? So I think that, you know, we always have to keep an eye on um, folks who may be having a difficult time, right? And uh, we're trying to create a culture with these open, a um, couple of these open environments and in small group check-ins and, um, to see how folks are doing, where we can have some casual conversations, say, hey, how's it going? Take the break, maybe taking some time off, um, although there may not, you know, it, it's difficult to walk away because your home and work is also home and home is work kind of a thing. Um, so I actually had a conversation with um, uh, Commissioner Zuniga yesterday, uh, because he did come to our office hour and we, we are looking at maybe more one-on-one uh, -on -one check ins that we are doing with staff or maybe in small group capacity um, for conversations that may not be ideal for a larger forum like a town hall or a commission meeting or something like that to um, touch base. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me just build on that comment, which was one, one, one point that I wanted to make. I was um, able to talk to um, Tripti, Natasha, and Jacqueline yesterday um, on one of the office hours. And um, just want to mention that, uh, you know, Tripti just gave a very brief uh, summary of all the activities and all the thought that they've put into this uh, matter. But the efforts are really significant and worthwhile. I encourage uh, people to think about uh, do a checking with themselves first and say and look at uh, some of the resources available. Um, the, 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 this arrangement that we have, uh, um, you know, because of this uh, uh, pandemic, this remote arrangement is, is okay, but it's still really not quite the same and it's now been, you know, extended for some period of time. And um, that may mean that people may need, uh, uh, you know, uh, some kind of accommodation and, uh, or, or again, uh, uh, an individual check-in. And that is uh, really important to, um, uh, you know, to, to contemplate. Uh, if, if, if needed. Um, supervisors have a role, uh, uh, HR has a role, and uh, the point is that 
there's many ways in which we, they, uh, Trupti and, and others, have thought about continuing support given this arrangement, and I encourage people to think about it if they need to, um, but seek and, and, and consider uh, those alternatives of support. Other comments for Trupti? I, I would like to add in that um, you, I agree with uh, Commissioner Cameron. We appreciate you really covering at a very high level today all of the work that your division is doing. I do know that the, um, the training that you described, the supervisor training, I think at one point, and Tripti, correct me if I'm wrong, you really were looking at um, you know, focusing on our gaming agent division. Uh, and then out of it, you, uh, the um, really it, it spiraled to to extend more widely throughout um, the organization, and that folks were really excited about this opportunity. Is that is that right, Chupti? Yes, that's correct. Um, initially, we you know identified that there was a need within our um, supervisory team within the gaming agent group, but we also felt as we thought about it further that this could be a great way for training across the entire agency for all of our supervisor at varying levels and um, a great opportunity for you know folks to stay in touch with one another and recognize that although they may be in different departments some of the challenges or opportunities to develop are one and the same and uh, rather than having a one-off training program we uh, with Natasha and Jacqueline's help we developed a training for the entire year that happens on a that will happen on a monthly basis so there's some flexibility in being able to uh, take the training on online on their own time but then walking away from that training with a couple of you know thoughts and sharing them during uh, the follow-up meetings uh, which are intent intended to just be a learning opportunity but also an opportunity to create a community and connections with other supervisors and um, folks across the agency. So, so Bruce Ban, thank you for sharing that program um, more widely. Um, I know you were excited about the opportunity for this development for your team and it's been office-wide benefit. Yes. Yeah, it, it's great for the, the staff and, and even myself, I'm enjoying it as well. Great. So, and, and again, um, to Commissioner Zuniga's point, uh, these professional development opportunities are also great opportunities for the connections that we are missing during this period. So, thank you. Um, that was just one that I uh, that you listed among all of them. I'm really excited about the cultural opportunities. A uh, little preview because I'm going to put Troop D on the spot, but we're really hoping for a cooking class um, <laughs> that initiates sure. with Troop D. Uh, so, so thank you. Any other questions for uh, Chupti at this time or for Karen? And of course, we want to thank um, uh, Jacqueline and, and Natasha and, and Derek. Uh, so thank you for the, to the entire team. I also want to thank uh, Jamie for continuing to coordinate our schedules, commissioners, so that we get to have um, individual meetings with the different divisions. I you know, got to meet with the, the uh, Community Mitigation Fund folks. Uh, I think maybe Commissioner O'Brien, you met with the communications team this month. You know, it's an opportunity. I say selfishly, it really is for me um, because I, I wouldn't be seeing uh, these groups as as easily without all the coordination that Jamie's giving us. So thank you, and and thank you to all the divisions for for meeting with us. I, we all miss you. So thank you. All right, Karen. Anything? Oh, I am. Um, I would like to go back to item 3A. Yes. Um, just for some clarification. As um, uh, Loretta, if you could update us on one matter that we, we hadn't gotten an update on, which was there was a particular restaurant that decided to close at a certain point, and it's my understanding we had gotten a briefing from you on a couple of issues, and there's an update that you hadn't shared with us. So. You're muted, 
oh, so frustrating. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're referring to Mystique at Encore. They had uh, closed after a, a troublesome gathering there uh, where they took a very um, robust response to that and on their own initiative uh, closed. They, they have reopened. I thought I had updated at the, our last meeting, but perhaps not in the type of detail that you're looking for. We had uh, said at the time of their closure that any reopening would be subject to approval uh, by the IEB. And I'm gonna turn it over to Bruce to let you know they have reopened. I'll let you know, I'll let Bruce uh, tell you exactly what it is that, that has been approved. Yes, uh, they are open Thursdays through the weekend. Uh, we did a complete inspection and continue to inspect to make sure that it stays that way. We measured the seating and the distancing in the restaurant uh, along with the, uh, the owners and they were 100% cooperative with us and uh, they continue to, to maintain the restaurant with uh, proper distancing. So everything's worked out uh, rather well for us. Commissioner O'Brien? Yeah, I, I, I have a memory that some of the high top seating in the area um, troubled somebody, some people in the IB in terms of making it look more like a bar than a restaurant given what's allowed right now. Do they still have high top seats or did they change that? They still have the high top, top seats, but the distancing between them is, is uh, you know, fine. They don't have as many seats at the table and, and so on. So they, you know. So uh, did that satisfy the concerns that I know, Loretta, it, you it, expressed some concern in that regard. Are you satisfied with the layout? I, I am, you know, we, I had been concerned about it. They have made, uh, uh, I think, appropriate adjustments uh, and as well as just the overall monitoring. I mean, they really got the message that was not an intentional situation on their part, you know, what, what had happened. Uh, so, you know, relying on uh, what, uh, what I've seen and, you know, what Bruce's team has uh, reported, I feel comfortable uh, with the adjustments that they've yeah. made. They they did close a, a long high top table that was there all together uh, with it. So th that might've been the one you were talking about in particular. Okay, great, thank you. So we, we thank them for being responsive. We, we do know it was um, that their response was full sum at the time and now it sounds as though you're satisfied. So thank you for that update. All right. Uh, Karen, anything else? Nope, that's it. I just want to thank Trip D and their whole HR team for all their good work and the update. And you know, if the commission's interested in these kinds of uh, updates from the team, we'll, we'll continue those because I think it is helpful to see the, the amount of work that's been going on behind the scenes. Always interested. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move now to item number four. Um, we'll Next here, an update from the independent monitor, Alejandro Montenegro Almonte. The commission appointed the independent monitor to fulfill a condition of our decision in the matter of Wynn Mass LLC, which was issued on April 30th, 2019, relative to the suitability status of the holder of the Region A license. Uh, in that decision, uh, the condition is set forth in detail in section 6B2. In our packet of materials for today's meeting, we include the independent monitor's PowerPoint that will be presented today. Immediately following that PowerPoint, you will find also um, a response from the company. The independent monitor offered the com company the opportunity to review the report in advance for factual corrections and in turn, we offered the company the chance to respond to the full report. So I wanted to note that to make sure that uh, those attending today's meeting did see the company's response. Um, I think uh, you'll also find after that response, the uh, full version of the uh, independent monitor's final report with the appropriate redactions. Again, those materials are all available in our um, packet. So let's get started, Ms. Um, Montenegro Almonte. Would you first begin by introducing your colleagues and then uh, sharing the PowerPoint? 
Yes, of course. Good morning, uh, Madam Good Chair. Morning. Good morning, Commissioners. It's a pleasure to see you all. Um, I thought when we met in May, we'd be maybe meeting in person this time, but but here we are again. Um, I do have with us our team who are all very familiar to you. We'll start with Preston Pugh, um, who's here joining us today, Ann Sultan, Catherine Pappas, and Nicole Gokchabai. And if you will Thank you. share here. Thank you. Can everyone see that? Excellent. Okay. I see heads shaking. Thank you. So this presentation is a summary of what we've called the phase two assessment report, which is a follow up to the baseline uh, recommendations that we made earlier this year. Just a general overview of what we plan to cover with you today is one, just a reminder of what our goals were in the second phase. And of course, we'd be remiss not to talk about the general impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, both on the operations and on our exercise. We'll talk, uh, go over a summary of our review and the testing activities that we were able to accomplish, and then close with just some overall observations of where we perceive the company is now in its enhancement of its HRCP, of its human resources compliance program, and specifically the recommendations made in our baseline. We'll go findings um, by the different compliance hallmarks. We'll review those um, briefly just to ground us again in, in what it is that we're looking at here and conclude with some observations. And of course, always welcome a uh, question and answer to keep the conversation moving and dynamic. And of course, to make sure that we're addressing any specific questions and concerns that the commission has. The goal of the phase two review was first of all, to really focus on the company's implementation of our baseline assessment. We made a number of recommendations in our baseline review. And the focus of this piece was to both test how the company had progressed vis-a-vis -vis those recommendations, but also, of course, to continue our ongoing review and assessment of all key elements of the company's uh, HR compliance program, which we lay out here just by way of recollection, of course, critically important culture of compliance and conduct at the top, proper authority, oversight, and independence, policy procedures, third-party relationships, training and guidance, internal reporting and investigation, incentives and discipline, risk-based reviews, monitoring and testing and controls environment. So we'll go not recommendation by recommendation. I'm aware we have an hour and a half, but really just the key takeaways under each of these hallmarks. Starting with the, the general impact, I mean, it really, I think for anybody, uh, is hard to overstate the impact that COVID-19 has had on all of us, particularly on the company and its operations. We'll recall our first report was issued shortly after the pandemic hit. This was at a time when both Encore Boston and Win Las Vegas has ceased operations for an un, that time un, undefined period of time. During the coming months, we saw personnel turnover, including at senior levels of the company for a variety of reasons, of course. Employee furloughs, which were mentioned earlier during the session. And you know, resources that were already you know, stretched relatively thin, had to be diverted and deployed to ensuring the health and safety of WIN employees and to stabilizing the company's operations. That truly was an extraordinary circumstance that none of us could have predicted coming into this second phase of the monitorship. It inevitably had some impact <clears throat> on the monitorship itself. We did see and we anticipated to see some delay in implementation of certain recommendations, particularly those that required the operations to be up and running, interaction with employees. <clears throat> we were, however, able to test, um, we were able to conduct some of our testing remotely. Um, and, and I must say, and I do want to you know, take a pause here, it provided a really unique opportunity for us as a monitor team to view the company dealing and responding to an unprecedented crisis at the same time that it continued to address the critical events that brought us here as a monitor team. And it's, it's important for us to note that even though the efforts that the company undertook to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic were outside of the scope of our review, we really do commend the company for emerging as a leader in Vegas and Boston, particularly as it responded to its employees, which is you know, tangentially related to some of the issues that we look at. 
And what we saw there was the company organically creating a self-standing COVID-19 response program that had so many of the elements that we are evaluating in the context of the HRCP. And we saw them work in that context tremendously well. And I'm speaking there from, you know, tone at the top, we saw the CEO of Win, of, of Win Resorts immediately emerge as a leader for his organization, backed by the board of directors, messaging his absolute commitment to putting his employees first. That included continuing pay, which included continuing tips. It included launching a, a, a white paper about um, how to effectively mitigate the risks related to COVID-19. And what we saw on a day-to-day -day basis as we worked with the company during the monitorship was that message and that commitment cascaded down through all levels of the organization. We saw engagement, ownership, a real sense of independence and autonomy of all the folk functions that were involved in mitigating this risk. We saw communication with employees on a regular basis. We saw communication with third parties on a regular basis. And what inspired us is that to see the company pivot with very little time to respond to that crisis, we're hopeful that it uses that experience to translate some of the creativity and resources that it deployed in the COVID-19 context to continuing to address issues of sexual harassment and discrimination. And by no means am I equating a global pandemic to the issues of this monitorship, but they are, they can become uh, a, a crisis to the company, of course, if, if not adequately addressed. So we do commend the company and are encouraged that uh, really provides a playbook that can be adapted for other aspects of compliance. So what, what did we do um, since we last spoke in May? Um, I will say, despite the extraordinary um, circumstances the company found itself under, we continued to see a high degree of cooperation from the company with our requests, and there were many. We were able to review over 200 documents that were produced by the company. There was no, um, no limitation in what we were able to see. We requested both you know, publicly available and also, as we had in the last phase, some confidential documentation all was made available to us appropriately. Um, we were able to interview 32 um, interviewees across the company from board of directors to executive management on down. Uh, all interviews, of course, because of COVID were conducted by, via video. Um, everyone made themselves available. We had you know, ample time and opportunity to speak to people that we wanted to speak to. What we were not able to do was conduct on-site testing. Um, we had noted in our um, work plan for this phase that we did not anticipate to conduct any focus groups during this time period as we had in the first phase, mainly because we wanted to have given the opportunity for the company to actually roll out and implement the recommendations and test them once they'd actually taken root. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we do hope in the near nearish future we'll be able to to resume those on-site activities, but again, um, feel very comfortable with what we were able to to see and, and, and again thank the company for the for that cooperation. Overall observations, the company continues to express a general commitment to enhance its HRCP. When we spoke to executive management, we spoke to the board of directors, we heard some of the same comments that we heard in our first phase. I think where, where the company is right now, it's really still developing and kind of translating that expression of commitment to the operationalizing of that commitment. And we'll continue to monitor that closely in this phase. And that, that really is where the challenge is for most companies, right? Is how do we cement the commitment that we have in a way that is meaningful and sustainable? And one of the areas, of course, that we focus there on is policies and procedures and formalization of governance practices, which we'll talk about in other areas of, of this presentation. But again, um, cooperation over, remains quite, quite strong. 
So starting with culture of compliance, you know, I, I, I do want to go back to this, to this, what we witnessed in the, in the COVID-19 pandemic, because it really reflects what we're hoping to see from the company in the context of HR related issues. One of our greatest folk, one of the, the clearest ways a company demonstrates culture and, and, and commitment is by communication at its highest levels. It's important, of course, to have it throughout the community, throughout the, throughout the organization. But what we saw resoundingly in our baseline review was that employees really want to hear from executive management that they are committed to addressing harassment and discrimination. That they, you know, as I, I recall, uh, employees in, in our focus group said, they want to know that they have their backs. The recommendations focus on helping the company develop a strategic communication plan that allows these types of communication to occur in an ongoing basis in a very organic way. Finding opportunities where the CEO, members of executive management, will be front-facing employees to find those opportunities to inject messaging around HR compliance. And the absence of that strategic plan, I think, became a little palpable in, in the context of COVID-19, where you know, we didn't see engagement on, by executive man, by leadership on HR issues, in large part, of course, because they were dealing with COVID-19, and that, of course, distracts. But when you have a strategic communication plan in place, it doesn't even have to be something that you have that you have to remember to do, for lack of a better phrase, right? It's something that could have continued and been sustained, notwithstanding the emergence of an unexpected crisis. So when we talked about in the baseline assessment and in other um, in our prior communication about the importance of embedding compliance into the DNA of the company, that's what we're talking about here. And and you know we did see some one some some communication coming from at the property level that we'll talk about um, in a few moments but critically important to have an actual plan that can can be sustained throughout the throughout the company's organ, uh, operations the other way that we test culture and uh, a culture of compliance is by the degree of resources that management dedicates and allocates to compliance here we focus largely on the uh, filling of senior leadership roles that uh, touch HRCP compliance. Earlier on in, our, in this phase, we saw a vacancy at the Chief Global Compliance Officer position and also at the Senior Vice President Human Resources position. Um, those two roles have been filled. And you know we're we're pleased to have seen that they're critical roles to the success of this HRCP. There are, however, three other roles that we consider to be critical that have not yet been filled. One is the director of executive compensation and benefits. That role was instrumental in the company's plans last phase to develop a robust performance management program. We continue to view that as critical to compliance, particularly given that the plan included, as it should, criteria related to compliance and living the values as part of an employee's annual performance evaluation cycle. The other position is the director of um, DNI, Diversity and Inclusion Initiatives. That position will be filled, um, what we understand in the relative uh, future. We're excited to see that happen. Many of the initiatives that were being developed uh, by the then director of DNI have been stalled, um, and we expect to see that continue again in the near term. And the last position um, that we're interested in seeing filled as well is the Council for Employment at EBH. Prior to even our baseline report, that position was vacated. It's a critical role, um, provides a significant deal of support and expertise on these issues at EBH. Um, we continue to view it as critical and are hopeful that the company will move forward in backfilling that role as well. I wanna go back to the SVP role of HR for a moment. 
that role was when we first reviewed it in our baseline report. It was a corporate level position that reported into executive management, first to the CEO, then to the CFO of the company. That position has been restructured in that now it reports to the president of Win Las Vegas. While still holding a senior VP title, it's no longer, if you, we were to view uh, an org chart, at the same level as some of the other executive management positions, which is, again, something we review when testing whether or not executive management is truly demonstrating its commitment to compliance. And, you know, this is one where we don't want to focus too much on form over substance, but we do view reporting lines to be meaningful with respect to the stature that a uh, personnel is given at a company and the respect that that role and the authority that that role is perceived to have within an organization. We've been, um, the company has explained that there are, you know, practical reasons for the, for the reporting lines to be structured as they are now, but that the intent is that the new um, senior vice president will continue to operate at a company-wide level and will effectively be a corporate role. So we'll be very closely looking at that function to ensure that it reflects a global HRCP strategy for the company and not just one that is focused on Las Vegas. That brings us to the next uh, element, which is proper authority, oversight, and independence, which of course is dovetails to what you know we were just discussing. There is, we observed both during the baseline, and I think it became again quite noticeable during this phase two report, the need for the company to truly clarify and segregate, if you will, the various functions that touch on human resources compliance. And that would be the chief global compliance officer, the general counsel, and the SVP of HR, and then of course the organizations that cascade below them. The reason being, without scope definition, there cannot be true accountability and independence. This played out in our phase two report where it became clear that there was a lack of, of clarity amongst the different functions of really who was owning what part of the recommendations that we had rolled out. And, you know, we think with that clarification and delineation, those sorts of um, ambiguities that lead to certain issues falling, potentially falling through the cracks can be mitigated. The company, you know, had an opportunity while those roles were vacated to define where one stops and one starts and where there's overlap, how that can be reviewed. Um, their position is, you know, their, their view was that it was best to fill those roles and evaluate once the new uh, personnel were in their seats to define um, what those roles are. So we will continue to, to work with the company to review ultimately how that delineation pans out. We had discussed in our baseline report also the ongoing need to strengthen um, the compliance committee with an additional member that has significant HR subject matter expertise. And I think I said this before, but you know, I'll say this again, that is not at all um, an indication that we view the experience of the current compliance committee members as overall deficient. It's a very, it's, it's a tremendously qualified group of individuals sincere commitment to compliance, including HR compliance, but don't have that depth of HR experience that would be of value to the company, given that it's an advisory function, on how to bridge that gap that I spoke to earlier between the expression of commitment and the oper operationalizing of commitment. We think someone with that level of focused subject matter expertise would be a tremendous tool for the company to be able to figure out how to practically and meaningful, meaningfully implement the various elements of the HR program that, that they're ta tasked to enhance. 
policies and procedures, um, we saw you know we saw some limited progress. We made a, a number of recommendations in our baseline report on how the company can continue to enhance its policies and procedures. They'd made some headway even before we came in. We identified additional opportunities. You know, policies really are the bedrock of a compliance program. Um, they serve to communicate, to define expectations. More importantly, they help to uh, they help the company hold employees accountable to the conduct that they expect. And we saw some some progress in modifying and implementing some of our recommendations. There is still work to be done. We received drafts towards the end of our drafting phase, and that will be reflected in the report, demonstrating that you know we received some drafts due to timing. We weren't able to fully evaluate um, how those drafts align with our expectations, and we'll continue to provide observations to the company in short order. But this is an area where we do um, encourage the company to think critically about a, a culture shift. The company is a relatively, at an executive level, a small group. Um, and not, you know, companies generally feel that policies and procedures can be administratively burdensome. And there's, you know, a balance there to be drawn between going to that administrative burdensome extreme, but also ensuring that you have clearly defined governance structures. And I'm referring to governance when it comes to HR compliance, again, monitoring and implementation. And that I do think will require a bit of an internal culture shift to move towards the procedures that are being followed right now less formally, because we do see procedures being followed, but truly documented so that they can be assessed and evaluated to ensure that they are designed to address risks that we identified in our first report and continue to observe as we continue through the monitorship. Senior management has expressed a uh, commitment to, to move in this direction. And we encourage the company to communicate, to encourage management to communicate that commitment and to hold um, personnel accountable to delivering on, on the enhancements to its policy universe. Third party relationships, you know, traditionally refers to third parties, consultants, advisors. Um, we looked, of course, at that, uh, at those relationships within WIN. You'll recall in the baseline uh, report, we spent a good amount of time, though, focusing on patrons and guests and noted the really the highest risk of harassment and discrimination for the company. And, I, you know, certainly didn't come as, as, as a surprise was from its patron and guest population. We encouraged the company and made recommendations that would focus communication to employees, particularly to cocktail servers, um, hotel attendants, hotel room attendants, spa attendants that are faced with one-on-one -on -one interactions with patrons that have led themselves to um, face inappropriate behavior. Critically, in our baseline report, we encourage the company to communicate their um, lack of tolerance for that behavior, to make it clear that there is no gray area, right? Um, and again, just to reiterate, there was never a question that the company would permit any sort of, of touching. It was verbal um, harassment discrimination that was reflected in the groups that we, in the focus groups that we saw where employees felt patrons crossed the line and because it, you know, fell, fell short of conduct that is truly offensive, some focus groups participants indicated they viewed the company as um, sometimes having a double standard if there was a VIP guest involved or just having a lack of uniformity into how that conduct was, behave, was tolerated. The company updated its policy on, on employee interactions with third party guests and addresses that point in that policy. The company makes it clear in its opening statements that it does not tolerate any form of harassment or discrimination, that the policy applies to everyone and guides employees in telling them that they 
must feel empowered to stop service, that they have an obligation, and this is important, that they have an obligation to report guest misconduct to managers. And critically, also includes a section that instructs managers and supervisors who might be on the floor and how to respond to these incidents and requires immediate reporting um, to HR. So we feel that's, that's a significant step forward in communicating, again, these commitments and expectations to the employees who are most vulnerable to harassment and discrimination. It can't stop there. And we are, you know, still um, one of the recommendations that followed from, from the changes to the policy was requiring a focused training on managers and supervisors to ensure that they understood exactly how they were to behave under this policy, what those expectations were. Um, that we expect um, will be completed in the coming months. And we have, I should pause here, in where we have seen recommendations that were not completed or were not fully satisfied. We've reissued them, this time with a deadline, um, just to, to incentivize, given everything the company is, is facing, a, a move forward to completion. We have seen, um, and we'll, we'll talk about this in, in training also, some campaigns, focused property campaigns, reinforcing the obligation of employees to speak out against harassment and discrimination, which of course is important. Where we've not seen progress is in communication directed at patrons. And we understand that can be challenging, but we've also seen the company in the last year engage in effective and direct communication with its patrons with signage, with intervention, if someone is not wearing a mask or violating the six foot rule. We reiterate that the company really should look back at what successes it has had in those efforts and find ways to implement that to third party conduct when it comes to harassment and discrimination. We've encouraged the company to think about ways that it can do this so that it feels that you're you know, encouraging a standard of behavior as opposed to telling someone, you know, don't harass or don't discriminate my employees, which feels to the company, and you know, we've heard this from, from other organizations as well, is something that people should know and something you shouldn't say. Um, you know, but we have seen signage at the building, for example, that you know, says no weapons, no um, illegal drugs, right? No um, wear shoes. I mean, it really, there are opportunities there that the company, I think, can continue to, to um, explore. We did have an opportunity in this phase to review investigation files that related to patron misconduct. Importantly, we were, uh, we were um, given access to security investigation files. We selected those on a randomized sample and really saw, I think, a cross-section of the types of incidents that the company faces. We reviewed those files with a critical eye towards identifying, one, the types of misconduct that the company, uh, that employees encounter, and of course, also looking at how at least the file reflected the incidents were addressed. We focused on whether there were any indicators that VIP guests based on you know, where the incidents occurred, we could somewhat tell where there were VIP guests involved, whether they were treated any differently than guests who perhaps were not considered VIP. In the sampling that we received, we saw no indication of any um, double standard, if you will. But this is something that we will continue to monitor very closely. Training and guidance. Um, critical, you have your policies and procedures and we have to communicate to employees uh, what they all mean. The company has been, has continued its our HRCP policy um, and procedure training. The annual training that we had seen before continued during um, the pandemic in safe ways, of course. Uh, we were really pleased to see that the company trained um, a new board member 
that joined and, and I should have noted this before, but we were able to observe the onboarding of the newest board member of Wynn Resorts and noted, um, I mean, from the criteria that the board was looking to add to the board, um, we met with him, we had a, a great conversation with him. We're happy to see that part of the um, criteria for selection included integrity, included a commitment to diversity and inclusion. Um, they were looking for diverse candidates as well to bring in different voices and perspectives to the board. And we're really quite impressed with the new board member, has a demonstrated commitment to diversity and inclusion, really um, understands the issues that we are dealing with here and you know we're confident we'll continue to um, you know further enhance the the, the wind board we did um ask whether he had been you know whether in the interviews right some of those criteria that were reflected on paper had been touched on confirmed that yes you know the both board members and executive management were very interested in understanding his commitment to these issues and experience related to these issues and even though he joined after the board training um, had been conducted the company had one-on-one -on -one training with him on hrcp policies and we were quite pleased to hear that the Compliance Committee also received the training that we recommended. An opportunity that was identified for us there was the, the, the trainings of the Board and Compliance Committee really focused on Las Vegas, on Nevada law. We've encouraged the company and made recommendations that future trainings ensure that they include uh, Massachusetts, applicable Massachusetts employment law. The, both the board and the compliance committee, of course, are tasked with oversight of both properties. And it's important for them to understand the legal landscape of the states in which those entities operate. Even more important where there might be some divergence in what the laws require, what expectations are, that those be highlighted both to the board and to the compliance committee. The company is in the process also of developing function specific training. Um, you know, we see so many different um, functions that intersect with HR issues and that intersect with harassment and discrimination that must address it, that it's important to have, you know, short, it doesn't have to be, you know, too long, but short focused trainings to help you know, a cocktail server versus a spa attendant, right? Or, you know, a manager on the casino floor versus a manager in the spa, how to handle the very different situations that they and their employers or employees are gonna face. Also important to continue to train corporate security on issues related to harassment and discrimination. We did see, um, I think it's called Win Win University, but it's it's a it's a long it's a five day program for security personnel that has you know, a number of modules, which I'm sure you're familiar with. That touches on sexual assault. We did not see um, any specific training sessions on um, sexual harassment and discrimination, and perhaps how to address. Um, how to address those situations when security is brought in, which is very different than, you know, than an assault. Security Academy is what, is what it's called. Um, they will, we, we recommend that they, that the company develop a module that focuses on these particular issues um, as well. We've also uh, understand that there has been some uh, training on unconscious bias for security. We haven't seen that. Um, so we'll be either confirming that it has occurred um, and that it continue to occur. And if not, we'll be just previewing there, uh, recommending that that training occur. We think it's important that, um, you know, again, to ensure uniformity and consistency in how issues are addressed that um, unconscious bias training occur. And we, of course, um, reissued a recommendation requiring that the company develop methods for testing the effectiveness of training programs, you know, whether it be, you know, a poll at the end of a, of a live training session or a little survey at the end of an online training session uh, or a quiz, if you will, to ensure that trainings aren't only, that people aren't just participating in the trainings, but that they're also 
really understanding what it is that they're hearing. And this came from focus groups where, you know, we asked people about the training and there were, you know, there was some recall of things that were said and, you know, maybe perhaps hypotheticals that really stood out, but there was a sense that we sh the company should be testing just really how much those messages are, are sticking to ensure. It also serves as a way of reinforcing the training itself. Internal reporting and investigation, of course, a critical area of focus for us, um, given the, uh, the events that, that brought us here. The company has made for us a, a large focus was updating its investigations policy to ensure that the entire reporting and investigation process works as it should. And that included from intake to routing of an allegation so that we're precluding the risk of people who might be named in an allegation, in a complaint, receiving a complaint, um, from ensuring that you've got subject matter experts involved in an investigation so that it's thoroughly reviewed, ensuring that both the complainant, whether they be anonymous or not, are appropriately communicated with, both at um, intake and throughout the life of the case. Um, that the person who's the target also is appropriately communicated with addressed, that where there is a need for um, retaining documentation or accessing cell phones, that there's guidance within the policy. And of course, we do not expect a policy to anticipate every situation, but certainly to provide the guardrails that we know to be a best practice in how to conduct and manage an internal investigation particularly important given the events that brought us here, that the policy and procedures reflect guidance on how to respond to allegations made against senior or executive management. We've seen a draft of the policy that addresses um, some of our concerns and will continue to give, that, that's one of the policies that we saw. We had some high level comments in the report, but we'll have a deeper dive with the company on our observations. We think it's also important that the policy include guidance for ER and HR on conducting interviews and ensuring that they're looking at all aspects of the allegations or new information that might come up in the context of an investigation. And also that the resolution and the closeout of an investigation is thorough and clear. We had the opportunity again in this, um, in this phase to review sample investigation files. And we had the opportunity to review, you'll recall monthly reports that are um, escalated to the GC and quarterly reports that are escalated to the compliance committee on harassment discrimination. From those, we selected sample files. Our samples included allegations across both properties um, and against all level of personnel, including senior management. Um, and we've made some observations in a report uh, along those lines that inform our further um, emphasis on the company enhancing its internal investigations procedure so that there are no missteps of the kind that were you know, seen a couple of years ago. We also um, saw training, which was critically important. Um, the company took advantage during the first months of quarantine while everyone was home to require ER employees and other, and, and other functions who are related in investigations to attend a several day training conducted by an external firm to really walk through all aspects of an investigation. Now that training was um, focused on general practices. The investigation policy had not yet been updated when the training occurred. By all accounts, the training was incredibly well received. We spoke to people who participated in it and we heard words that we rarely hear, which is we want more of it, which shows, demonstrates that, you know, there, there is a desire um, to, to learn to do these better. So we, we continue to recommend that the company has these trainings on an ongoing basis. And more importantly, once its policies and procedures are finalized, that they train specifically to those policies and procedures. 
so that they are clear to all personnel um, tasked with following them. Oops. We had, um, based on focus group feedback, made a recommendation on the importance of ensuring that employee relations is available to employees at, during a longer period of time as issues arise. Now, we noted in our baseline report that employee relations works around the clock very often. They'll come in to interview employees in the graveyard shift if they have to as part of an investigation. What our recommendation went to is to have ER present for that counseling side that comes up unexpectedly. So we had managers and supervisors and focus groups tell us, you know, I have a complaint from somebody on the floor at 1 a.m. on a Saturday, and I don't have anyone in ER that I can turn to right away. And sometimes I can't access them for another couple of days when it's my next shift. Those are lost opportunities for training and guidance and ensuring that investigations are effectively responded to when they come in, um, allegations. The company, in part because of COVID, because operations were, were limited to begin with, um, and also because prior to our coming in, there had been a longer period of office hours for ER that the company felt was not utilized in a way that made it valuable for the company to maintain these hours of operation for ER. Our recommendation was that they do a test run for a period of time but that to ensure that employees knew those hours were there, that there also be a communication campaign around the fact that the hours were going to be extended. We, continue, we reissue that recommendation given the um, theme that emerged across both properties and our prior focus groups and employees desiring that access. Incentives and discipline, um, you know, important, you know, you've heard me talk about accountability and the importance of, pol of having written policies and procedures that the company can look to to hold its employees accountable um, for compliance. The most significant area for us, of course, was the development of an annual and formal performance evaluation program, which, you know, because again of the vacancy in that role, has stalled. We do view that as just an important for every organization to have a formal a formal evaluation program across its operations to ensure compliance. But here, what you know, even before we we'd asked the 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 director at the time already anticipated bringing in elements of compliance into a person's performance evaluation. Right? How does this person live our values? How does this person demonstrate a commitment to compliance? And so, for example, a manager can be rated quite highly if they are consistently using pre-shifts, for example, to message the importance of compliance, uh, or is being very vocal about the urgency that, you know, her team attend a training within, you know, the, the required period of time. We also recommended identifying other ways of incentivizing and rewarding behavior consistent with HRCP values. And we encourage the company to leverage um, programs that it already has in place, like Employee of the Month, right? Um, which could very easily, you know, I think be adapted to situations related to HR. So for example, if, um, a cocktail server is faced with a difficult harass harassment situation and is, a is assisted by a security guard who just <clears throat> really handles it well and makes her feel supported and makes her feel safe. That cocktail server should have the opportunity to commend her colleague for the way that he intervened with the situation. Those sorts of examples are what, you know, we're hoping the company can can relate to, and you know, we've seen it actually, we've seen the company do this during COVID. You know, we understand the security team has faced truly difficult months in, in both properties. And the company held, has held different events to think security um, and has recognized personnel for really going above and, and beyond. So we know that there's a, there's a framework there <clears throat> that can be leveraged for these issues. 
risk-based reviews, um, <clears throat> this really speaks to both looking back and looking forward in a compliance program, right? And it's ensuring that, well, it's reflecting and understanding that risks are dynamic in an organization and that a compliance program that is designed today for the risks that are identified will not necessarily be fit for purpose three years down from three years from today when the risk profile of a company might change. So we recommended that the company develop a risk assessment process, folk procedure focused on harassment and discrimination risk. And I have to say this is an area that the company went above and beyond our recommendation. Our recommendation had been that the company leverage existing internal audit procedures and that it include areas focused on HR. What we received was a standalone HR risk assessment procedure that had all of the elements of the risk assessment procedures that a company would have as part of its just overall ERM processes, identifying um, applicable government regulations. So it includes EEOC guidance, it includes DOJ guidance, it includes applicable state law guidance on HR related issues. It identifies the types of documentation and data and information that internal audit will use to test um, the effect of the design and effectiveness of the compliance program. It includes interviews with personnel in charge of elements of the HR program. Most critically, it reflects a bottom-up approach in identifying risk. So really goes through active employee position by active employee position to assess where there might be HR risk and risk rates them. And that is the type of data that the company should leverage as it periodically monitors the effectiveness of its compliance program, right? Are, however, you know, the, the top category of risk profiles, do our policies and procedures speak to them, right? Do our trainings speak to those particularized risks? The risk assessment procedure also creates an HR CP steering committee, which is a cross-functional group of HR facing functions or HRCP facing functions that will work together both through with internal audit through the risk assessment process, but more importantly, will also help in the implementation of any corrective action that comes out of the risk assessment procedure. So at the out at the you know the output will be a report by internal audit that will go to the compliance committee the audit committee of the board and the steering committee reflecting where the HRCP might need some modification and enhancement. That's the type of sustainability that we look for and truly commend the company and particularly the internal audit function um, for this lift. We'll be um, evaluating the implementation of it, of course, um, you know, the, the, the procedures look wonderful, and we'll be, of course, testing how they ultimately are implemented, particularly that output of uh, reporting up to the compliance committee and to the audit, and to the audit committee, and how those um, areas of improvement are actioned. This is a close cousin to monitoring and testing, of course, which the company continues to monitor sexual harassment and discrimination through allegations that are reported through the company's various reporting channels. And um, we'd recommended in our baseline report that the company review, if you'll recall, the GC receives all harassment and discrimination claims on a weekly basis. And on a quarterly basis, all of those are reported up to the compliance committee and to the audit committee of the board. Based on our interviews in the baseline phase, it seemed unsustainable to keep that level of attention case by case coming to the GC every week. And while we certainly encourage that level of transparency, it's equally important that the company be able to focus on key trends and aggregated data, right? Not just on what's happening on each case. The company engaged in discussions internally 
um, and then engaged in discussions with us and really does continue to see value in the level of detail that the GC and the Audit Committee and Compliance Committee receive. And we've, you know, we, we agree with that. Um, based on follow-up interviews, it seems the administrative burden has already decreased. But more importantly, will continue to decrease because the company is, in the very short term, going to be rolling out a new internal reporting channel that will allow the company to both keep its detail reporting that is currently occurring, but also generate higher level reports that will reflect these trends that we think are important for the company um, to pay attention to. So we've withdrawn that recommendation for now based on the company's just really sincere um, feeling that they add value. And we've seen that value reflected in communications that we have. Um, even with the compliance committee, they, they like that level of, of transparency. And we certainly will not be encouraging less transparency. Um, and we will, of course, and, and we're hopeful that through these risk assessment procedures and this cross-functional HRCP steering committee, the company can also develop monitoring and testing methods for other aspects of the program as well, not just on reports of um, harassment and discrimination as we're seeing so far. And by that, I mean completion rates for HR trainings, effectiveness of HR trainings, right? To give an example, or effectiveness of communication by senior management, um, frequency of communication by mid-level management. Controls environment. Um, we focus here on really the areas that were highlighted in the MGC's decision and order, which were one, engagement of external counsel, specifically ensuring that external counsel are engaged with attention to conflicts of interests that might arise from dual representation. The MGC's decision and order don't have to refresh your recollection, but of course focused on company counsel also representing the then CEO in matters that were adverse to the company. Um, the, 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 there was, I think, some confusion by what we meant in our recommendation that has now been clarified. Um, so we expect to see progress in those procedures coming forward um, and expect that they will be a well-documented policy and procedure that lays out um, how engagement will occur and what criteria of review will be um, included. Similarly, we focus on the initiation, review, and approval of settlements related to harassment and discrimination. Um, there, again, you know, we, we need to see more uh, specific guidance on how settlements related to harassment and discrimination will be reviewed and approved particularly um, with respect to claims that might be made against senior management or executive management. We've recommended that consistent with some procedures the company already has, those be treated as higher risk and require dual approval, not just um, you know, approval by, by legal or um, otherwise. And we did, by the way, see sample harassment and discrimination um, agreements that were entered into over the course of our monitorship. We looked specifically for language related to confidentiality provisions to ensure that confidentiality provisions weren't, over, weren't overly burdensome, that they didn't amount to um, unlawful restrictions or gag um, clauses. We, di we didn't see anything of that nature. Um, so we don't have concerns based on, on the settlements that we reviewed that there is any overburdening of, of complainants when it comes to confidentiality obligations. We looked also at um, mandatory and binding arbitration provisions, which were, of course, enumerated in the commission's uh, decision and order. 
There we did see um, some use of, of mandatory and binding arbitration provisions that need clarification, particularly with their applicability to harassment and discrimination claims. And we've made recommendations in our report to ensure that the mandatory and binding arbitration provisions do not apply to Title VII, um, specifically harassment and discrimination claims. So that leads us to our concluding observations. Um, you know, again, given the events of the last now almost year, um, you know, we did see a company that was forced to divert attention away from the development of HRCP. Um, you know, we, we do think that, of course, is understandable, but just further reinforces the need to have a strong, independent, embedded program that can be sustained and can continue to operate in all of its, through all of its elements, despite other crises that the operation might, might face. We continue again to see um, expressions of commitment to the HRCP. We will continue to test how that commitment is operationalized as we look forward. Um, and you know, we're, we're looking forward, I think, all to, to a new year. Um, where we are able to engage on a continuous basis with the company at all levels on these issues and hope to see some, some real progress moving forward. Oops. And here, here's our team in case not everyone can see them. So I'm happy Thank to, yeah, questions. Thank you, Alejandra. Yeah, if we can restore the screen. Yes. Um, uh, thank you for the thorough report. Um, I want to give opportunity for my fellow commissioners to ask questions. Who would like to go first? And you can, of course, ask one now and return later. Commissioner Cameron. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you. Very thorough um, report uh, on, on, the, on the work that you've done. I mean, some positive, certainly, the sincere engagement. You mentioned that several times. Um, you know, the active monitoring of sexual harassment, the new system that will go in place, those are all very positive. The one concern, not concern, but thought that I had while I was uh, reading the report was how many uh, policy deadlines are upcoming, very quickly, actually. And is there is there a was there any conversation about the uh, capability to update all of those policies within the next couple of months? That, that's a great question, um, Commissioner Cameron, and it is something we were reflective on, given that the pandemic is not over and the company does still continue to feel the impact of it. We were able to um, run those deadlines past the company and have received no, no pushback. Um, we did on, on one and we were able to actually bump that deadline back because it was, it was unrealistic. It was with respect to the code of conduct, which you know, requires more than just changing language, but they wanna redesign it. It requires approval by the board. Um, so where we sit here today, we understand that the timelines are aggressive, if you will, but I should also note those drafts are already underway. So we're not asking the company to start anything from scratch between now and you know I think the first deadline is the end of March. It's incorporating, which gets here faster than, than we can count, um, it, which will then give them time to reflect our pointed and direct feedback. And these are, just to clarify, right, these are recommendations that were made back in, in May. So we're just helping re refocus. Okay, thank you. Of course. Other questions, Commissioner Zuniga? Yeah, let me, um, let me mention, uh, thank you again for the, the, the very thorough uh, report and presentation. Um, you know, I, um, if I may, uh, you, uh, you characterize well uh, the context uh, of this last year, that credit should be given uh, you know, to, the, to the unprecedented circumstances in which we're all operating or they're operating, even the COVID pandemic. Uh, you also mentioned, um, you know, uh, earlier in your presentation that there is this gap between the expression of um, commitment, uh, 
uh, to, to certain things in general and the operationalizing of, uh, of that uh, commitment. Um, and um, as I read, as I read uh, your, your report, it's, um, it has a lot of um, recommendations that you have uh, reissued as you, as you call them. Um, and uh, uh, you know, given the context, uh, it occurs to me that if they were to start uh, or to, to pick some of the um, most important ones, let's say, to, 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 to manage with the resources that they have available. In addition to the deadlines that, that, that you were mentioning and Commissioner Cameron was mentioning, uh, would it be fair to say that, um, that, that perhaps some of the top priorities would be relative to progress towards communicating with patrons? In, in addition to everything that they're doing internally with their operations, procedures, that one area is really around patron interaction? Yes, that is that is a core area of focus and something that we would encourage the company to prioritize. And, you know, I would say it's both to patrons, but also to continue to engage with employees themselves on the company's expectation, because so much of what we heard in the focus groups was there's an emphasis by the company on service right, on providing five-star service. And that's so ingrained in employees that to really help employees, and, and I will say that the third-party policy, the employee interaction with third-party policy that I referenced starts that conversation, right? And it, and it actually says, we pride ourselves in our service, but that doesn't mean you have to tolerate this behavior. So I think commissioners, when you for it to really be effective, they have to focus on, on both populations. And that, you know, if we, if you can give me two priorities, right, I think it does really focus. Um, the other one really would be on continuing to enhance its internal reporting and investigation procedures, right? I mean, and, and you can see why those two really have to overlap. Um, at, at all levels. And, you know, we will continue to be looking with a, a critical eye at how investigations are opened, responded to, investigated, and, and closed out. Thank you. Um, this, I, I had another minor, uh, but, but, I, but I figured, let me, let me ask it. Um, I think the recommendation you say relative to quoting uh, Massachusetts employment law in, in the mm -hmm. is very important, it should be important for us. But I did wonder if you see that there's some differences between the two states that may be, you know, of particular relevance to this conversation. So there are some 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 nuanced differences um, that would apply, and you know, I I do have to. I think you might have heard me to say before, right? I'm not the counsel. I'm not the company's lawyer. I'm not their legal counsel, so I have to make sure I stand on on the right side of that line in answering that question. And you know, suffice to say, we do note nuances that we think are worth highlighting particularly to the bodies that are tasked with oversight of compliance with those laws. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner O'Brien. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to reiterate um, a thank you to you and your team for the report, um, trying to, for both you guys as well, trying to keep up with the monitoring in addition to what the company is going through. And I first wanted to also reiterate um, from where I was sitting on this end in terms of their, the company's leadership in terms of their COVID response and how impressive it's been. Um, and I, I take sort of some positive signs from that and then also some frustration from that because mm -hmm. I do think that they are capable of um, doing tremendous things when they put their minds to it. Then there's a couple areas in here that even notwithstanding the COVID, to me, I certainly hope they listen to you and the report and to this commission in terms of a couple areas that were highlighted in the decision that are still areas for improvement. One of which I think is what Commissioner Kuniga just commented on, which was what seems to be a repetitive um, oversight or disregard for a distinction in Massachusetts in terms of law applicability, et cetera. And I really hope that there is attention drawn to that going forward. Um, you highlighted some of the examples in terms of mass law, MCAD requirements, pregnancy related issues, not just pregnancy, that sort of thing. Yep. Um, I am also the, also concerned about the, um, the conflict of interest, the concept, um, their embrace of it. I would also certainly hope that that is something that's emphasized going forward with the company as they go forward. Um, we are hopefully crawling out of COVID-19 
Um, and I hope that the leadership that they've shown in getting through it um, will evidence is their ability to turn attention to that and very quickly catch up with the deadlines they've talked with you guys about as being reasonable, et cetera. So I would hope that the next time those areas have had some substantial progress because I do think, as you state, they've done a tremendous amount of work um, protecting their employees and the public in these circumstances. So I would hope it would continue when some of those burdens are lifted. And I, again, thank you to everyone on your team for all that you've done under the circumstances as well. Thank you for those comments, Commissioner O'Brien, particularly and your gratitude to the team. We are 100% aligned with your observations and the criticality of the areas that you've noted and we'll continue to honor our mandate in focusing on those two core areas as well. Commissioners, uh, thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, uh, you've all touched on a few um, areas that I noted as well, but I did have a couple of additional comments. I'll share my uh, a few and then and perhaps you'll have a chance to reflect as on whether you have additional questions or comments for Alejandra. Uh, first, again, to reiterate what you've heard, how thankful we are um, to all of you for fulfilling your significant responsibility. Uh, this was a significant condition uh, to our decision, and you've been able to manage this remotely. And um, I know that at least one child has been born during this time, and and we congratulate uh, the family on that. And uh, so you've done it um, again, using uh, having to pivot yourselves. And for that, we thank you. And also, of course, thank you for the thoroughness, the thoughtfulness, and, and particularly the tone of your report. It, it was very important to start with a recognition for the company's leadership um, as it um, addressed COVID-19 really early on. And, and, uh, and, and as you know, they have been, uh, we've been very, very lucky to have such a cooperative relationship with them and, and really benefit from their expertise and leadership in that area. I thought Commissioner um, Zuniga brought up the good point of um, the communication strategy. I think, um, I, I think that's an easy one for the company to, to address. Uh, as you point out, they are exceptional in terms of their ability to communicate. And what I like most is that this is not necessarily, this is probably um, an area where you would have, as the independent monitor raised this as a, an important component. But what I like most is that you're hearing that directly from their employees. Mm -hmm. And because I know they care so much about creating um, a safe uh, and, and welcoming uh, uh, and supportive culture for their employees, I see that as something that is, is easy um, for them to, to work on. I also really like the idea that um, with respect to performance incentives, I loved how you framed the idea that um, you intentionally, um, it's with intentionality that you encourage uh, compliance. And you know, the compliance can have kind of a negative connotation. I like the idea that you're supporting um, the priorities around sexual harassment and the, the HR issues and the example of where perhaps a security um, guard may support one of his colleagues um, or her colleagues when they observe something um, and, and that there's an opportunity to, to reward that and create incentives for really everyone uh, getting behind the important work that you've outlined. Um, I, I um, also just want, I think that we've addressed the, the import of policies and procedures. And again, when readers look at how detailed your report is, they may get lost and well, this is so much and there's so much best practice. And I guess that what I like is that this is a framework where so much of it is so doable and, and it will in fact a, a, just launch this organization into a place of leadership around these, these areas that, that, that came from a crisis, just like they are doing with COVID-19. I thought a big takeaway um, 
and, and a compliment that you gave the organization was on the internal audit work. Mm-hmm. And if I understand correctly, that's a big roadmap for them to now say, all right, these are your risks. These policies and procedures need to be put into place. This training needs to be done in order to support it. And the fact that you congratulated them on that work being in place, you know, given this really difficult year, then again, hopefully, as Commissioner O'Brien says, we're, we're starting to crawl out of that, that bad time. And, and they can now really make sure those internal control metrics are addressed. So um, I, I thank you for the so much positive um, even though you've highlighted that there's work to be done, uh, a lot of the work for me um, seems to be clear and straightforward. One point I would say, and, and Commissioner O'Brien um, noted it, you know, the two of us are both lawyers, so perhaps it jumps out at us, but I, um, I, I appreciate that you've said or uh, suggested that perhaps the recommendation was confusing to them and now that's been clarified. Um, I am looking forward to that issue being addressed um, uh, because I do think it's so, uh, it was so critical in our, in our decision. So I'm looking forward to that being addressed sooner than later. Those are, those are my observations. I wanna return back to my fellow commissioners for other observations you may have. All set, Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner Zuniga, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, before before we, we say um, uh, thank you, more formally thank you to all of you, and, and again, I do want, I want to give Preston the opportunity to chime in. Um, Preston is in a little bit of a different role as a subcontractor because he shifted um, for many good reasons um, uh, uh, his, his work to another firm. Preston, did you want to weigh in on uh, anything that you'd like to highlight for us? Uh, uh, Commissioner Justine, thank you for that opportunity. Um, I would just very briefly say that like you um, uh, and, and like Commissioner O'Brien, also uh, uh, Ms. Almonte, um, I look forward to seeing their progress in the investigations areas uh, in the uh, places where we noted. Um, I, I think that there's a sincere commitment and we need to match it with the level of action that we've seen in some of the other areas that we've discussed. Um, uh, this is a different time. You know, we all hope that we'll be out of this time, right? Uh, uh, soon, we don't know. Uh, so there, you know, a number of institutions, uh, Encore being one of them, may have to figure out a way to improve its processes even though we are in the middle of a pandemic because we don't know you know how long this thing is going to last so um i i would i would i would leave it at that i you know i know we've had additional discussions and uh, i'm available to you at any time thank you so um again to the entire team um Nicole, Catherine, and Anne, of course, and Alejandra and Preston, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you for uh, your attentiveness and for today's presentation and for the the strong PowerPoint. Commissioners, would you like to close out? um, Other than, am I reiterating your thanks sufficiently? Yes, thank you. Very uh, very informative and it's, it's really good for us to track this progress. Thank you all so much for the opportunity. Commissioner O'Brien? No, no, I can say thank you again. (laughs) Great. (laughs) Everybody wants to move on, so. Yeah, well, and and again, stay safe and stay well. And um, just on the dog front, we know that Alejandra has a new beagle in her house. So um, in addition to a baby who's keeping uh, a family up um, awake, I know Alejandra's got the new puppy. (laughs) Lots of developments this past year, but I will say Charlie, Catherine's son, has been a ray of sunshine for all of us in this year. He turns one next week, which is hard today. to believe. Today. Oh, today. today. Oh, birthday. my goodness. <laughs> Happy birthday, Charlie. 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 Wow. Yeah, it's a great name. And and uh, it seems to me that we should be excusing Catherine so she can go uh, set that little one-year-old right. properly. Get some snuggles. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all so so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, We appreciate it.
before we turn on to um, item, our next item on our agenda, um, I just want to also highlight again, as I mentioned, that the company did have the opportunity to respond and it's a two page document. Um, I, I took a look at it, at it, I'm sure my fellow colleagues, uh, commissioners did, and they did note um, the, the pride that they have in their, what they refer to as the Herculean um, efforts of the entire team during this, uh, this uh, COVID-19 um, <clears throat> period. I wanted to just point out one, one line that I thought um, reflects the tone of the independent monitor and I think the tone of the company. And it was with respect to the recommendation that the company hasn't had yet hasn't yet been able to implement. The quote is that uh, the company, we, remain committed to implementing them. Even though we remain operating in a challenging environment, we know that the recommendations are made with the view of assisting us in enhancing what we believe is an enviable work environment. And I think that's a good place to close this discussion that they recognize it's a collaborative effort and that in fact, the work of the independent monitor is intended to be helpful and, um, and intentional. And so with that, um, again, that is included in a very large packet right after the PowerPoint. So, all right. So I think um, uh, the team of the independent monitors, we can, formally dismiss you um, and uh, we're going to go on to um, the matters of our budget. You're, you're welcome to stay for that if you would like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks Thank so you. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Okay. Um, so I think before we have our, our break, we've intended to go forward with the, the, the finance. Is everybody still okay? Commissioner Zuniga, I turn to you first. Are we all set still? And then have a break after the budget. Yep. Okay. Yeah, all set. Commissioner O'Brien. Okay, and Commissioner Cameron. Yes. All right. Sounds, sounds right. So I'm going to turn then to um, uh, the the finance division and um, our very own Derek Lennon, our uh, chief of financial and accounting officer, and his team. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, Sorry. Still, are we seven still? Minutes, seven minutes. We're seven minutes. Table. Just yeah. seven and, more minutes. And Derek, if you could just sit a little bit closer so we can hear you. It might be my older ears right now or my Zoom ears. Thanks. Yeah, if, if it's not working, I can put in my headphones too. No, that's good. That's good okay. now. Thank you. Um, so good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good morning. I'm joined by Agnes Bollier and Douglas O'Donnell, and we're here to present the second FY21 quarterly budget. I uh, just want to say that um, Catherine's son is sharing a birthday with um, my wife. So I'm looking to end up this rather and uh, get off to some festivities as well towards the later half of the afternoon. Happy birthday to her as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a good day. So it is a good day. Yes, um, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission approved an FY21 budget for the Gaming Control Fund of $32.42 million, composed of $26.9 million in regulatory costs and $5.52 million in statutorily required costs. After balance forwards from, the FY20, um, from FY20, the assessment was reduced from $29 million down to $27.61 million. And the commission approved an additional $5 million assessment for the public health trust fund. Just as a reminder, um, that, that $5 million was split with 3.75 of it being um, billed starting in September. And then the final assessment coming at the end of June of 1.25 million. And that was um, all part of a discussion to try and ease some of the burden during the initial um, pandemic because the casinos were closed for three months leading into the fiscal year. Um, for this quarterly update, the finance office is recommending an increase of 172,000 to the gaming control fund, um, and is composed of decreases in payroll, fringe, and travel budgets, an increase in the independent monitoring fees and litigation costs. Uh, a main thing to remember is the increase in um, independent monitoring fees will be offset with a 
um, corresponding increase in um, our revenue assessments. So the, the actual net impact is a $23,000, $22,000 decrease to the, um, to the Game and Control Fund budget through this time period. Um, we're also recommending an administrative budget for the Community Mitigation Fund. And finally, um, as is uh, customary, we're recommending adjustments to the licensee share of the second year, um, half of the assessment. So um, a little more detail following through the men, um, memo. When the budget approved the FY21 Game and Control Fund budget, we were mainly watching two items. Uh, litigation costs, which we funded at the bare minimum required by our insurance policy, as well as the Massachusetts State Police overtime. Uh, as of this review, we're requesting an additional 300,000 in the litigation budget on top of the minimum required by our insurance policy. And we're, um, for the Massachusetts State Police overtime budget, I'm pleased to announce we're not gonna require any additional funding. Um, while the OT is up by a little bit, we've actually seen attrition in that um, unit. So the attrition is actually more than offsetting the um, small amount that the overtime was up. And you know, there's a lot of, we're getting a lot of reports from MSP on the overtime. Um, I know that the facilities were closed for, you know, closing earlier for a amount of time, but we've also had some health issues hit at the facilities. So we've had to use overtime to fill some regular shifts. Um, so I think they're doing an excellent job of managing that right now. And the reporting is very transparent and clear. Um, so if any of you would like an update on that, Brian's reports are excellent at this, at this point. Um, We'd initially included in our budget a turnover savings projection of 250,000. We're also pleased to report we've uh, met that figure. And for this report, we're projecting an additional 50,000 in overtime and uh, turnover savings. Um, we are recommending shifting 227,000 in salaries, fringe and indirect costs from the gaming control fund to the community mitigation fund, which I'll touch on a little later in the memo. Um, as I stated earlier, uh, we're increasing spending for bills paid between 10-1 and 12-31, 2020 for the independent monitor by 195,000. We'll also, we've also increased our revenue projections by that 195,000 because that gets billed directly to the licensees. So that's basically a wash. Um, 205 CMR 121 describes how the commission shall assess its operational costs on casino licensing, including any increases or decreasings as a result of over or underspending. Um, the commission has determined that once a year on or about January 1, and this year we use the actual date of January 1, it'll revise the number of gaming positions utilized for de determining licensees proportional share of the assessment and use that percentage for the billing of the second half of the annual assessment. The tables on pages two and three of the memorandum um, walk through those changes. And Doug is here um, in case we have any questions to follow up on that. Uh, he has worked with the licensees um, to make sure that this year we are 100% in agreement of the numbers for the casinos. And then we'll be working with them to make sure we don't overbill, as you can remember, was a problem last year with all the changing numbers. Um, so that is the report on the gaming control fund. Before I move away from that, I'll pause if there are any questions or if you want me to just run right through, I can go into the uh, community mitigation fund. Any questions for maybe for Doug on the gaming positions? Are we all set? It looks like we're all set, Doug. Sounds Thank good you. to me. Great, great work, but stay tuned. Right, thank you. Um, in a public meeting on December 27th, 2020, the commission approved regulations for the community mitigation fund. Um, it was 205 CMR 153. 205 CMR 153 paragraph five allows the commission to expend funds for the administration of the program. The general requirements that, that um, the administration costs do not exceed 10% of the amount available in that fiscal year. The precise amount be set at a public meeting and that the cost be directly related to the administration of the program. Um, so to meet all those things, we're requesting a budget of 337,000 made up of staff from the Community Affairs Div Division, 
um, which only work on this program, as well as funding for a database for the program, supplies, and in-state travel reimbursements for the program. Um, the, the staff are, com uh, are composed of half of the um, chief of the Community Affairs Division and then 75% of the two employees in that division's time. Um, so there's still a component of that Community Affairs that is paid for by the Gaming Control Fund, um, but this is the approximate amounts that um, we can estimate will be um, <coughs> mitigation fund matters for, the, for this personnel. The 100,000 is a is a swag, I'm gonna be honest. Um, we think it may be done cheaper in-house working with Katrina's team, but we um, would rather go a little higher um, and, and not have to come back to you before the end of the year to have additional funds and then just have that revert back. Um, we brought in in excess of $7 million. If you take a look at the time period that the grants run through, we brought in excess of $7 million. It was closer to $8 million just from gross gaming revenue in the Community Mitigation Fund from <clears throat> January 1 through December 30 of 2020. So the 337000 falls well below that 10% uh, of money of new money that came in, never mind what's available from previous years for expenditure in the fiscal year. Um, so we, we believe that we have met all the requirements um, of this, of the administration of this program. We are looking for it to be retroactive to July um, 1. Um, you know, I, I had requested this in the budget memo at the beginning of the year, and then we had put it through the regulation process just to make sure that no one disagreed on the administration side of um, being eligible against the Community Mitigation Fund. We discussed it with all the um, local advisory committees. Um, so I'll pause here if there are any questions regarding the Community Mitigation Fund request. Uh, thank you, Derek, for reminding us that the, you know, the full process of the regulatory process and the fact that there was lots of input sought on, on this um, new funding mechanism. Commissioner Zunica, do you have anything you want to comment on? Yeah, thank you. I, um, I'll just comment that I think it's, uh, the recommendation is very appropriate. I'm on board with um, how you calculate um, the amounts. I think uh, the reality is that, you know, probably there's a little bit more time uh, by, by the staff being charged, spent uh, on, on the actual community mitigation, but that's okay. Um, you know, there's a retroactive nature of this that maybe offsets that a little bit. And we had already discussed um, you know, going back to the beginning of the year anyway. I'm particularly um, glad to see that we're now gonna have a, you know, um, uh, an amount, a carve out, if you will, uh, for a database. I think uh, that's, a, that's a need that uh, had been identified before that is going to, uh, allow us to to manage the program a, a, a lot more efficiently, uh, which is you know a big reason to um, uh, you know to, um, to to charge some of those costs to, to that uh, fund um, anyway. So I like the recommendation, and I think uh, as as uh, as Chair Stein mentioned, I I think it's also good to highlight the process that we've had uh, up until now for this for this part. Other questions um, for Derek on the community mitigation fund piece or for the report? I, uh, Madam Chair, I just had one comment um, and it is something that certainly I've paid attention to over the years and that is the state police overtime. And um, I know we have tasked uh, Captain Connors with really um, being very hands-on when it comes to that overtime and I do commend him uh, as, uh, as Derek just pointed out, for really um, being very transparent about the process and what happens. There's always a tension in policing about uh, full-time positions versus fewer positions and filling in with overtime. Uh, but it sounds like much of that overtime is due to uh, individuals, uh, not only attrition, but individuals who have been out um, and unable to work for a variety of reasons. So. Um, I think that, you know, 
what they're doing, what they're tasked with doing. They're doing it very, very well under these trying conditions. And uh, if they meet the standard of approval from our uh, CFAO when it comes to uh, how well they're managing the overtime, I'm sure it's done, uh, and not surprisingly, it's done very well. So thank you. Yeah, and just a point on that, I want to remind everyone that that overtime number was flat from last year where the casinos were closed for three months. So it was an aspirational number to begin with. And Brian and the team have really um, taken taken this on um, head on. So really impressed with it. Thank, Thank you. you, Commissioner Cameron, for, for raising that. Uh, I had hoped you would. Um, <clears throat> Captain, <laughs> Captain Connors has been a great uh, team player on on this difficult issue. I think Commissioners O'Brien and Commissioner Cameron. I believe that Captain Connors met with the licensees to to make sure that they understood the process and methodology on overtime. And then, of course, during this period, uh, you know, the state police have have had to do a lot of pivoting. Uh, often, you know, we they've borrowed from our unit uh, during these times. So there's been a lot of coordination. So the fact that it came out flat is, is all pretty um, astonishing uh, and, and again representative of his careful, Captain Connor's careful um, work. But I do know Cap, uh, Commissioners O'Brien and Commissioners Cameron, you, you both have, um, have worked on this issue, so we appreciate it. Any other comments? Or, and Derek, do you need, do you want to close out um, before we ask for final questions? Yeah, so Joe Delaney has joined us as well. So if there are any questions around the Community Mitigation Fund, um, he did have a hand in helping us develop this. Um, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that when he didn't see it for the first time when we were sitting in front of you and have you guys ask him a question and say, I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, so if you have any questions regarding additional requests um, for the Community Mitigation Fund or where we may be heading with that, Joe has also joined us. And if not, um, you know, I'd just like to say thank you to all of the, uh, this is a big pull together. You know, we have a lot of moving parts on this. So I wanna say thank you to everyone on the finance team as well as all the, um, as well as all the directors and chiefs for spending the time every month to sit down, review the information, um, get us updates so that we can pivot. I mean, we have costs of 300,000 going up in litigation and we're not pushing any of that back on an assessment. Um, that's really instrumental in people sitting down and figuring out where they can trim, um, being team players and not looking at their budget as just theirs. So, you know, I, I just want to say thank you to the team. Um, thank you to Agnes and her restored role for running the payroll numbers and, uh, and ask for your approval to increase the litigation by 300,000, uh, the litigation budget by 300,000 and allow us to, um, do the community mitigation budget for the first time. Should ask Todd if he wants to chime in. I know Todd, you're navigating the, uh, the issues around litigation. We thank you for all of the good work that you've done to keep us fully apprised. Uh, you've been working with Derek on this budget and you're in agreement. Yes, we discussed it uh, carefully. Obviously difficult to project uh, legal fees for the rest of the year, but that was what we thought was a fair estimate, just to be on the conservative side. Thank you. Well, if I if I may, Madam Chair, I would move that the Commission approve um, the budget adjustments um, and assessment recommended by um, by the CFAO Lennon in his memo I'll discuss it here today. Second. Any final questions for Derek and team or edits? Okay, I see all shaking heads. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. And Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. I vote yes. So thank you, uh, 4 0, Vivian. And um, I guess that concludes. Uh, this this item, and I, I feel now before we go into the quarterly reports that we should take our lunch break. Um, it's 12.10. Does that make sense to everybody still as we had planned? 
All right, then um, it's an odd, an odd number, but should we say, um, well, maybe we should say 1245 or does that work or, no, wait, that would not be good math. 12, yeah, no, 1240, it's 1210, not 1220. So 1245, we'll come back. Sure. Uh, as long as our guests will be ready, uh, I, I, Karen, I think we'll, we'll be all ready for people to start at 1245. And Joe, I see there. Uh, Joe, everyone will be all set for 1245? Yeah, I think that makes you, sense. Yeah, I told them that initially we were at one, but you know, always keep your eyes on the, the uh, meeting because you never know when things might move ahead or behind. I see um, at least PPC is on and they're saying yes. So if um, I think they're, they're in order in second, but we could always reverse. Let's plan on 1245. We'll reconvene this um, meeting number 335. And thank you, North. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. So we'll reconvene um, our meeting number 335. And we're now turning to our next item on the agenda. I'll turn it over to Chief of our Community Affairs Division, Joe Delaney. Oh, wait, maybe we should do a roll call, right? Sure. Um, Commissioner Cameron. I am here. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner O'Brien. I'm here. Commissioner Zuniga. Here. And I'm here. So Vivian, we're all here now. I'll turn it over officially to uh, Chief Delaney. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, so today before you, we have uh, two quarterly reports for the fourth quarter of 2020. Um, first up will be Encore uh, Boston Harbor, and then we'll have Plain Ridge Park Casino after that. And I think I saw Jackie on. There she is. Sorry, I had to unmute. Yes. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. So I'll turn it over to Jackie for Encore's uh, fourth quarter report. Great. Uh, good afternoon. And I also uh, wanted to introduce my colleague who's joining me. Uh, Juliana, are you on? I am. Hi, how are you? There she is. I have been wanting to introduce you to Juliana in person, and I kept thinking I'd bring her to a meeting, and then I decided finally she needed to just join us this way. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to present to you today. Um, I'm going to try, if I can, to share the PowerPoint. There we go. Did that work? We see still yep. the slides. If you want the full screen, I don't know if you know how to do that. We see the uh, the vertical with the slides on the left. Does that is that better? There, Perfect. there we go. Okay, so a quarterly report for the full quarter of twenty twenty. Whoops, very sensitive. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> our gaming, uh, for our gaming revenue and taxes, as you know, um, in accordance with Governor Baker's COVID-19 Order 53, uh, we ceased operations at 9 p.m. on November 6. And at that point, we started our daily routine of operating from uh, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, and as a result of the sort of operational hurdles uh, that, are, that accompanied that, we also closed the hotel on November uh, 2nd for the remainder of the second, uh, the, the fourth quarter. So I think the decline in total gaming revenue that you see and, and the, uh, the state taxes is reflected um, accordingly. So moving over year after over year, uh, despite some uh, problematic challenges this past year, uh, I think we, we've actually been pretty um, we feel pretty good about our results uh, year over year. Lottery sales continue to be strong. We actually didn't see too much of a decline uh, year over year. So uh, for October, November, and December, our total was 632,000. And just as uh, by way of comparison from last year, it was up quite uh, substantially. Uh, but you'll see that the, the, the third and fourth quarters look uh, very much alike. On the workforce, 
Uh, as you know, we have goals for minorities, veterans, and women employees. Uh, 50% for minorities, 3% for veterans, and 50% for women. Uh, we continue to show, um, to, to exceed uh, our goal for minority uh, workforce employees. We have hit the 3% for veterans, and we are slightly below at 42% for women. So we'll continue to focus on that as we uh, bring people back from furlough, and hopefully as things improve, to continue to hire. Uh, we, we're still strong in uh, employing people from our local hosts and surrounding communities, and uh, Massachusetts residents is at about 89%. And I'm going to turn it over to Juliana. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners. It's lovely to meet you all. Um, I've dealt with Joe very frequently over the past couple, year and a half or so, but um, I haven't had the opportunity to um, deal with the rest of you directly, so it's a pleasure. Um, Jackie, do you want to keep control of the PowerPoint? That's fine. Oh, sure. Um, so our operating spend for uh, the fourth quarter of 2020, um, all of these figures are based on our entire discretionary spend for the quarter, which was around $14,600,000. Um, Q4, we actually did great in terms of minority business enterprise spend. If you can see there, it's 23% of the Q4 spend was allocated towards minority business enterprise in that category. Um, we're still working on upping the veterans business enterprise spend and also the women's. However, for the quarter, our, our total diverse spend was up to 30%, um, which we're quite proud of. Um, our operating spend by locality is broken down here by surrounding uh, communities and also the state as a whole. Um, if you couldn't see during Q4, um, it's, it's done by percentage here. So 14% of our spend was allocated toward businesses in Boston. Um, the state of Massachusetts as a whole is up 50% um, for the year, up about $8 million. So it's a, a generous amount of our total discretionary spend for the quarter. Um, and just to highlight uh, something, of one of the vendors that we've been working closely with, Universal Screening Studio is located in Everett. Uh, we've worked very hard with them over the last year or so, I believe, or in order to be able to get them to a place where we can place larger orders. Um, and during Q4, we were able to a relatively large order for some of our promotional merchandise. They do screen printing and embroidery and stuff like that. Um, so we're very happy to be able to, to have that vendor be someone that we can count on for those, for those needs. And, and if I could just interrupt briefly here, this is a vendor that we've been working with for about seven years. Uh, you know, on little projects when we first started, I think uh, this vendor first did our Everett United uh, caps, but uh, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to take a vendor that we were working with, but in very small amounts and to be able to increase the, uh, increase the spend with this vendor dramatically. And now moving on to compliance. Um, this is the Q4 result of the minors prevented from gaming report. Um, it's, it's of note that there were no minors intercepted consuming alcohol at all during Q4. And the numbers are very low in terms of minors intercepted gaming or prevented from gaming. Um, you can see the average length of time was 41 minutes. The longest was an hour and two minutes and the, the shortest length of time was five minutes. And then just a quick update on our special events. There was, in terms of promotions with the early closing, um, it is not as robust as usual as I'm sure you can anticipate. However, um, we did have the opening of Win Sports during the fourth quarter. Um, if you remember, this is what used to be uh, more allocated towards Win Men is now uh, sort of sports oriented. So we sell um, hats, um, other sports gear, sweatshirts from everyone's favorite teams. Um, people are excited about that. Um, the other item that we were we were happy to highlight is the uh, Gold Star Family Tree that was located at the top of the curved escalators um, coming out of the lobby. Um, so this is a tree where people put messages to uh, loved ones um, during the holiday season. You can see the the close up there is some of the messages left by 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 individuals. Um, another holiday event wanted to highlight is our employee bake sale to benefit the Pine Street Inn. Um, we were we had a few of our chefs highlight their sort of specialties, um, sort of in a competitive holiday spirit as to uh, 
what people would want to see, and we're able to raise, um, I think, nearly six thousand dollars for the Pine Street, and including the Wind Foundation match. So that was nice during the holiday season. And with that, we'll open it up to questions. <clears throat> Jackie, would you mind if we had the full screen again, please? You can take them. Thanks so much. Commissioners, uh, I know you have the, uh, the, the slides in your packet too, uh, but we can bring up any slide that you'd like to look at in more detail. Commissioner Cameron. Well, that was a speed PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah. but a lot of interesting facts. Um, a couple of things. Obviously, really strong with uh, minorities in the in the both with numbers and with the spend. Do you um, do you have an idea in particular with the spend why that number was so strong? Is there something new that happened in the fourth quarter? I don't think there was anything new. I know it's something our team works on constantly. So for mm -hmm. each um, each package that we bid. We always try to include a uh, minority or veteran or woman-owned business. And I, I think it's just been a consistent effort and uh, is, is really starting to pay off. Right, okay, thanks. And also Universal, interesting to hear that you worked with them. Does that mean you encourage them to, um, to really hire more staff up so that they could take the larger con contracts? Did that mean more equipment was needed? When you say work with them, what does that mean? So we've been, as I said, we've been doing business with them for a long time. They've been uh, asking us for additional work. And, you know, in the past, we were typically getting a lot of this work done in Las Vegas. Uh, so we, we helped them develop the kind of quality that we were looking for. We told them, we worked with them to let them know what would work for us. And they were really ramped up. Uh, I know that uh, the Gaming Commission has also spoken to them. Uh, it's, it's a really little business and they've, they've, been able to rise to the occasion. Wow. Okay. Excellent. That's that's a really good story. And I was just curious about the lottery with so few patrons, those numbers were so strong. Any any thoughts on that? Is just your real regulars that are going to come are also lottery players? Is that you know, we've I think that's right. I, and I think over the holiday season and um, you know, yeah. you typically do wow. see an increase in lottery purchases. Um but I do think when we look at our player base that's returned, we're seeing about 60% of our regular players have returned. And I'm assuming that's probably the same for the, uh, the, same for the lottery. Okay, all right. all right, thanks. I'll let someone else to ask a couple of questions here. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, do you want to have questions for the Encore team? Um, the only thing I'm wondering is we, there's usually a, a reference to sort of compliance with underage drinking and access to the floor <clears throat> and um, I'm not seeing that maybe I'm just maybe it's not highlighted and it's in the deeper report but do you oh. have the numbers on that? Juliana do you have the, the full report with you? I do it's at the PowerPoint as well it's that one yeah. slide that big chart yeah it's yeah. right at, I think I'm on. scanning past it as I'm going through it again. So I think that they focused on the gaming but it is oh, at the end of compliance okay yeah, because prevented from gaming, but it is also, um, so if you go to compliance, uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Yep, okay, I uh, see the, you now. The good news, intercepted, it looks like zero, for, uh, but then there's, there's some others on, it's really on the gaming, otherwise. Yeah. No, I mean, I guess my only question is whether with the COVID measures and compliance, whether that's helped or hindered, it, it seems to obviously be tighter controls on getting on the floor. There are definitely tighter controls in terms of getting on the floor, uh, you know, because of the mask check and the temperature check as well. So I think the lines are slower and uh, probably more attention is, is paid to right. individuals. Um, but, and, and also the service of alcohol on the floor is much slower. Right, right. Okay, great, thank you. Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, if I may, uh, could we, Jackie, could we go to the revenues uh, slide where you do the comparison uh, year over year? I just want to talk a little bit about it, you know, offer some comments perhaps and put in some context. Sure. Um, One second. We went over the presentation. Um, 
That's the second slide, yeah. Yeah, it's perhaps the slide right after. Were you doing the comparison year over year? Here we go. There we go. Um, so remind us, um, back in 2019, when you were still operating uh, at full capacity, I suppose, um, the, the quarter, quarter four, um, was that the one, on, I guess it was quarter three. Um, you, were, you were really ramping up. You were in the, you know, in, in a, you know, in your first uh, eight months, I guess. Um, That's less, right. Because you opened in June. Uh, you were beginning to see some trends of, of some heavy visitation. And now you're comparing those quarters of growth towards this sort of stagnant and, you know, um, reduced hours in this in this case. Um, can, can you offer any more insights relative to uh, to those comparisons? Um, I know there's, there was this shift in, in, in the mix between slots and, and tables, um, as, as you know, as one would imagine, uh, a, a slot play is a lot more conducive to being isolated. Right. Um, and so, um, is there anything else that you can offer in terms of insights relative to those comparisons? Sure. You know, in last year, we're, obviously, we're continuing to ramp up, build our customer base. We. Uh, I think our customers were also making a decision about whether they wanted to continue relationships with our competitors or come to our casino. So I think that probably factored into some of that as well. Uh, as you know, we opened up very strong with slots uh, when we reopened and we definitely saw a change there. We also spent a large part of uh, the time that we had off in COVID redesigning the slot players, uh, bringing new products, and really trying to maximize the game selection. Uh, in, recent, in recent months, what we're seeing now is a research in tables. Uh, the table games uh, business is going ex exponentially again, which is great. So we're starting to see some of the uh, old players come back. That's great. And are you, um, are you referring more, at, uh, more recently? I've seen, you know, the, the, the you know, January and February, or, it, or it's really only been January and February. Okay. Right. Yeah, we, you know, on the Saturday night, we, we can't get enough dealers in. Right. Yeah. Right. Good to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on the uh, presentation? I am. Um, there are many moments when I regret that I can't visit Encore Boston Harbor, which is relatively close to my home. When I saw the bake sale, <laughs> I said, <laughs> I, was, I was feeling like I wish I was employed somewhere else because it looked really wonderful and then a nice gesture and great for the Pine Street Inn. So thank you. Encore always does things so nicely. So thank you. Um, and that and actually course, was an employee initiated uh, mm -hmm. bake sale. So our food and beverage department came up with that idea on their own and uh, the chefs from each of the uh, restaurants designed their own dessert and uh, employees got to go back to the house and purchase what they wanted for the holidays. So nice. So, so the employees, I wondered if patrons, um, if it were available to patrons, I couldn't tell that. So it's only for the employees to purchase. It was oh. only for employees. And then um, as Juliana mentioned, we have um, a foundation that if any of our employees donate any money to a, um, uh, nonprofits, the foundation will match that donation. So when we were able to donate the money to Pine Street and the foundation kicked in uh, a full match. Well, that's, uh, so it, it really brought it up to over 10,000, about almost close to 12,000, right? Really significant for the Pine Street Inn, uh, the Pine Street Inn and then of course the Gold Star uh, tree was so lovely. So, you know, during all of the, the challenges of COVID, it, um, you know, you've, you've continued to be all-star uh, community members, so thank you. I have no further questions. Thanks for the clear presentation um, and for keeping us surprised on our developments. I am looking forward to women being able to get back in the workforce. I'm assuming that the decline might also be attributed to COVID factors where they're not able to work as easily because of children being at home. So. I'm, I'm hoping that trend the good turns. News, the good news for our business model is because we offer um, different shifts at different times, we have actually seen women who've requested changes in their shifts.
to accommodate their child's the child care schedule so that they could have someone at home while they're able to come into work. So we're hoping to continue working with, with women to, to make sure that they can get back into the, into the workplace. Excellent, excellent. Well, we'll look for the next quarter and see hopefully that trend turn. So thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Cameron? Just one last comment. Um, I'm um, pleased to see that you, uh, you recognize that Boston would be much more interested in sports apparel than menswear. <laughs> it, it only took us a year and a half. <laughs> Great observation, yes. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Are we all set? Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Jackie. Nice to meet you, Juliana, even though it's virtual. We'll see you soon in person, we hope. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you. Uh, Joe, do we want to go on to our next presentation? Yes, thanks, Jackie and Juliana. Um, so next up, we have the Plain Ridge Park Casino fourth quarter report. So I will turn that over to North and his team. Oh, if somebody's speaking, they're on mute. Uh, good afternoon, North. Good afternoon. Hi, nice to see you. Um, are you guys able to see our screen at this point? Yep. Okay, great, wonderful, thank you. Um, now that I've got everything working. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, good afternoon, commissioners. We appreciate the opportunity to provide you with our Q4 2020 report. 2020 was a challenging year on many fronts. We're pleased to report strong results for both Q4 and the full year. The team will provide additional details in their portions of the presentation, but I'd like to highlight a few points. First, in 2020, 25% of our qualified spend was with diverse suppliers, which exceeded our goal of 21% of qualified spend. Additionally, the overperformance of the goal occurred across all three areas of diverse spend rather than a sharp increase in only one category. On the second front, on the compliance side, we are pleased to report that in Q4, we had zero instances of underage or minor guests reaching the gaming floor, zero instances of underage or minor guests gambling, gambling zero instances of underage or minor guests on property. Lastly, with regards to our workforce, we far exceeded our goals for diverse and veteran representation. Diverse team members made up 27% of our workforce on a goal of 15%, and veterans comprised 5% of our workforce on a goal of 2%. We're also pleased to see the similar representation of diverse veteran and women and team members at the supervisor. And so those are the highlights from our update. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Dana talk a little bit about our financials. Dana? Thank you, Nora. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners. It's nice to see you again this afternoon. It's nice to see you. I'll start with our revenue and taxes, slide two. There's a lot of information on this slide for comparison purposes, but I'll draw your eyes to the bottom of the chart. In the fourth quarter, Plainridge generated just under 27 million in revenue with total taxes paid to the Commonwealth coming in at over 13 million. Ending the year of 2020, PPC generated over 40 million in tax revenue, coming from 82 million in slot revenue. The year-over-year -year revenue decline is due to the ongoing impact of COVID-19. The next slide is lottery sales. Again, a lot of information on this slide, but for the fourth quarter, Plainridge sold over $350,000 in lottery tickets, which is down 55% from prior year. For 2020, the property generated over $1.3 million in lottery sales. The increase of 36% from the third quarter to the fourth quarter is partly due to the addition of a new member promotion that we had. If someone new came to the property and signed up for a player's card for the first time, they had the choice of a gift card or a lottery ticket, the, which was pretty well received by our new customers. Up next is our spend by state uh, for the fourth quarter. In-state spend was 629,000 or 50% of qualified spend. While the percentage of spend from in-state decreased from the third quarter of 67%, total dollars spent in-state increased by $260,000. Primary drivers of the increase in in-state spend quarter over quarter are vendors primarily for building repairs and building systems. 
Our next slide is a look at overall spend by state for all of 2020. Massachusetts spend came in at 1.5 million or 43%, and the remaining spend for the year is split amongst the states on the right. Overall qualified spend for 2020 was 3.4 million, whereas 2019 qualified spend was 6.4. Next slide is local spend. The in-state versus surrounding community spend for the third quarter shows an increase, or for the fourth quarter shows an increase over the third quarter. Uh, third quarter came in at 21,000 or 5%, with the fourth quarter at 135,000 or 18%. This is in line with our total 2020 spend, which I'll go through on the next slide. Our total 2020 local spend came in at 255,000 or 15%. Uh, I'm pretty proud of this figure, despite the challenges that all licensees had in 2020. We were able to increase our percentage of local spend year over year. So 2020 came in at 15% and 2019 closed at 9%. Moving on to vendor diversity. The fourth quarter diverse spend shows that we exceeded our goal in minority spend, but that we're under in our other categories. This is due to the timing of some large inv invoices that increased our overall qualified spend for the quarter, impacting percentages on this chart. However, we're, as North mentioned, we're pleased with our 2020 results, which I'll go through next. For 2020, we exceeded our goals in all categories, closing the year at 25% total diverse spend, 14% women-owned, 9% minority-owned, and 4% veteran-owned. Our procurement team continues to develop and maintain the relationships we've built with our diverse suppliers with some of our COVID-19 specific spend coming from diverse and in-state suppliers. Um, some of the examples of those items include hand sanitizer, PPE, sanitizing wipes and dispensers, cleaning supplies and signage relating to COVID. The last slide that I have for you today is the data behind our diversity spend in the fourth quarter. As I mentioned previously, some large invoices were paid during the quarter that increased our overall qualified spend. But as you can see, total diverse spend declined only 5,000 or 2.6% from the third quarter. If there's no questions relating to financials, then I'll pass it on to Kathy Lucas to discuss, discuss compliance and employment. Commissioners, do you want to do the first part now or do you want to wait to the conclusion? Uh, I, I, I can ask a question about the financials now, if that's okay. Sure. Um, you know, just a similar, uh, you know, similar question to the Anchor uh, people. Your comparison year over year and quarter over quarter um, in terms of revenues is, is pretty strong considering there's a, a lot less, a lot more constraints. Um, can you um, speak a little bit more about um, whether you've continued to update the product, for example, or, or do other kinds of um, promotions or free play or anything like that? Um, or have you seen, uh, you know, uh, offer other, any other insights relative to, to, um, to this look back, if you will? Absolutely. So our marketing team took a, a great look at when our players were coming in and shifted a lot of our promotions during our our time period where we had a curfew into earlier hours in the day to, to try to offer that um, when we had the time and the availability while also spreading it out over a longer period in the day so that we could maintain social distancing. Um, but we also are constantly looking at reinvestment on our floor and, and continuing to offer the product that our players most actively want to play. Uh, so that is an ongoing project for us year-round. Uh, but North, if you have anything additional you'd like to add? I, I think that there's a lot of noise coming through the Zuniga in Q4 with curfews being imposed and um, then lifting, um, being modified throughout the, the quarter in addition to um, what happened in surrounding states with regards to their curfews. So generally, I would say that we were pleased with the trends as they ended towards December and some of those restrictions started uh, looking a little bit a little bit differently um, as we came into the first part of the year uh, we've also been pleased with with those results so I, I think that what we will continue to see as um, the world 
becomes a little bit more normal uh, that we'll have a few more players come back and see. Garth, if you'll forgive me, um, if, for those of you who are not presenting, if you could just remember to mute because we're having a little bit more background noise than normal. Thank you so much. It just makes it easier to hear. Um, thanks. Commissioner Zuniga, is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. No, um, uh, that's, that's very helpful. Any follow up? Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, I just had one question as well. Um, and this may have been at, uh, answered in the past, I'm not sure, but Rentham is such a large part of the, um, of the local spend. Is there one or two vendors that really drives that number or? Yeah, we have a great, it's a great question, Mr. Cameron. We have a, a fantastic partner and a vendor that's based out of Rentham um, that does a lot of work in our facility in terms of um, repairs, maintenance, uh, minor construction and the like. Um, so that does drive up our local spend. Okay, great, thank you. But as I understood that though, the, the big takeaway on that was that was it on the local spend? Yeah, on the local spend, you went from from nine percent twenty nineteen to fifteen percent. Is that right? Yes, you're correct. Very good, isn't it? it? It's something that I'm quite proud of. Yes. Any tricks you want to share? <laughs> it, you know what? It was just partly in able to leverage some of our local surrounding community suppliers for COVID nineteen related supplies but it's also the impact of, you know, some of our functions being shut down and less spend going to other vendors, um, given the closures and restrictions. I see, I see, so that I understand. Well, um, perhaps, so this is, this will create an opportunity going forward that's sustainable, so thank you. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, are you all set right now? I am, yep, straightforward, okay, I'm all set. Great, thank you. Then we'll go on to the, the next next part of the presentation. Thank you. Sure. Greetings, Madam Commissioner and Commissioners. Uh, just turning your attention to compliance. During Q4, PPC prevented 643 individuals from entering the gaming establishment, of which 620 had expired, invalid, or no IDs. Nine were minors and 14 were underaged. During the fourth quarter, like North mentioned, we had zero minors or underage escorted from the gaming area, gamble at the slot machines, or consume alcoholic beverages. We'll move on to our, our employment slides. So all employees referenced in this exhibit were current as of Q4 2020. During the quarter, we had 335 team members, which is a decrease of 80 team members from Q3 after layoffs due to COVID business closures. We exceeded our diversity goal of 15% in Q4 at 27%. We also exceeded our veterans goal of 2% in Q4 at 5%. We saw a decrease in meeting our women's goal in Q4, falling to 42% from 53%. This was directly correlated to our layoffs, and we look forward to returning to those numbers when we're able to bring back our lounge, banquet, and food and beverage departments who all lost staff. We remain consistent at our local goal of 35% in Q4 with a percentage of 32 And in Q4, we had 335 team members, uh, 236 or 70% were full-time, 27% were part-time, and then 3% were seasonal. So we'll go to the next slide with our supervisors and above. Now, as we move closer to returning our staff, our commitment to recruiting from our partnerships that support diversity vets and women and local candidates is strong. We are comfortable and confident that we will return to these goals and you'll see this with our um, regular employment but also at the supervisor and above. In Q4, we had 72 team members of those. 26% is diverse, 4% are veterans, and 26% are women. 
and women is where we saw the decrease with our layoffs going from 37% down to uh, 26%. We've already launched our LEAP candidate interviews. And in, if you recall, LEAP is an internal program that we have at Penn that helps us identify talent at the uh, university level and bring them in for an opportunity to see what our business looks like. We're going to start recruiting from Hiring Our Heroes, which is a program that assists veterans with coming in uh, to our property for a period of time to get experience also lending to the opportunity for them to take on full-time positions once they um, leave the military. And then Women Leading in Penn and our diversity and inclusion initiatives are gearing up for a summer return with us, with us also being able to recruit for those roles when we're able to bring back those departments. And I'll turn it back over to North and open it up for questions. Thank you, Kathy. Commissioners, that concludes our report. Uh, and we're ready to take any questions that you may have at this time. Questions, commissioners? Commissioner Cameron. Yes, um, thank you. Um, you know, again, great job with compliance. You know, the zeros your team throws up on the board uh, from quarter to quarter, it, really amazing. You really are stopping those uh, underage folks from getting onto the floor and you've been consistently good with this, with this number. So I, it, it lends me to believe that you really do pay a lot of attention to this. And um, just one other comment. Um, so women make up the bulk of your hospitality staff and that's why those numbers are so low with women who tend to get laid off. Um, when there is a downturn before anyone else? I think it's more um, that the departments that we didn't bring back, so from a lounge perspective, many of our bartenders are female and many of our uh, beverage servers and uh, restaurant servers were mm -hmm. on the, the female side. So that's, you know, with us closing down all of our lounges and banquets, we did lose a significant portion of the team. As soon as the regulations allow us to bring those departments back, we'll hopefully recall most of those folks. But yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Kathy, I have a question for you. I'm just doing math. And so I want to confirm I'm close. On your last slide, what I'm seeing is that the, the employee categories, I understand it's supervisor and above, right? Mm -hmm. And so what it looks like is the total of, of diverse vet and women employees are 48, if you add those three up. And the total in, at the entire enterprise is 72, so that's two thirds. Um, of all supervisors and above are in our diverse categories. Is that right? So supervisor and above, we have 72 team members that are in the diverse category of the okay. 35. Oh, see, I'm glad I'm reading. I'm, I wonder if I was reading this wrong. Okay. Right. So to total got, supervisor and above, 72 people out of our 335. Of that 72, 26% are diverse, 4% are veterans, and 26 are women. And it, it could be multiples. It's not necessarily, like there could be layover in diversity. So. For okay, example, I understand, I understand, okay. Because what I was doing was adding up those three and yeah. defining, but that's not probably. No, no, it's a percentage of the 72. Result. So, okay. Thanks. Yeah, the well. Theoretically, one person could fall into three categories. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That's really helpful. Other questions for Kathy? All right. Um, very well done, North. I think this is your second quarterly report. Am I right? Yes. Yep. It's a little colder than it was for your first one. But it we're, is. We're uh, heading in the right direction, though. 
It's very similar to Colorado. It's just wetter. So. <laughs> I think that's fair. Um, any further questions then for our guests? For Joe? Okay, I see no. So uh, thank you to the folks from PPC. We appreciate all that you're doing and your continued uh, collaboration during these difficult times. We appreciate it so much and stay safe and well. Lisa, I see you. And uh, Dana, again, thank you for presenting and Kathy. Thanks so much. Thank you all so right. much, Madam Chair. Have a wonderful day. Thanks so much. That completes the report of the Community Affairs Division. Great. Uh, so I think then, uh, Commissioner Updates, do we have any today? No. Well, there's a little bit of sunshine left for Derek to celebrate his wife's birthday and uh, for the, the one-year-old celebrating down in the D.C. area. Um, if there's no, nothing else, then I'll need a motion to adjourn. The only adjourn. thing, Madam Chair, is it's also Ben's birthday today. So I did wish oh. him a happy birthday in person. He's on the other side of the office. So everybody, it's Ben's birthday today. Oh, so nice Happy to know. birthday to Ben. Yeah, I don't think he's on. He was working on something when I went by, so. <laughs> well, and I, 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 and I can share a little, um, a no longer secret, but apparently this evening I'm going to be learning the gender of a, of a uh, grandbaby that will be expected in August. Our first. Oh, wow. Um, That's exciting. Excited. Yeah. A reveal. So, uh, yeah, a very lucky one. There will be no fireworks or anything, but they wanted to learn uh, the, the baby's gender and uh, we're learning, but there's a few grandparents on our team, so I'm going to be looking for them for guidance, right? Uh, <laughs> so, anyway, so that will be not a birthday, but a, a reveal. So I'm looking forward to it. I'll, I'm just, I certainly will share something. Maybe I'll wear the color for... Um, the next meeting. All right, so we have a motion and a second and Ben's birthday, happy birthday to him. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye, thank you everyone. And I vote yes, Vivian, thank you so much. We're so happy to see you. Four zero, and thank you everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Nice, nice job today on this meeting. Thank you so much, everyone.